Hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Naveen Shaker, and I am from the Commission's Office of Energy Market Regulation. today and tomorrow. Um, and I was, I was just to start off with that, I think everyone knows we're in the midst of a, a very dramatic transformation in the electric sector. It's going to bring significant benefits to consumers, the economy and the environment, um, but it also presents some challenges. And, um, you know, some of these challenges are for system utility system operators. Uh, they need to continue to provide reliable electric service with a remarkable different set of generation resources than they than I think they were used to. And if you combine that uh, and their challenges in terms of res uh, addressing resource adequacy issues at the same time, the grid's being increasingly stressed due to more frequent instances of extreme weather. And I know that I was looking at the weather forecast. I know this uh, the Northwest this weekend, Portland is supposed to get to like 110 degrees um, uh, in June. That's amazing to me. It's, uh, and, and we saw extremely hot weather in California and parts of the, uh, the, the desert Southwest as well last week. And so, we know that the, that climate change is is with us, and it's going to pr present significantly increased challenges in terms of um, uh, it, it stress on the system, certainly demand on the system, but also stress on uh, power plants and other generation resources. As both NERC and, and the WECC recently highlighted in separate reports, the Western interconnect in particular may not, in the near term, have sufficient resources during region-wide extreme heat waves to satisfy electric demand during certain hours. As we witnessed last summer, California ISO experienced rolling blackouts during two days in August, when record-breaking temperatures hit the entire West. We have convened this conference to get a common place of understanding for the situations that stand in the region, and more importantly, identify feasible paths forward to ensure sufficient resource adequacy across the West. When the situation is complicated, it is not difficult to recognize that greater regional coordination is going to be necessary. In fact, Cooperation would have a massive payoff given the region's diversity of energy resources. There's incredible wind in the North Intermountain West, hydro in the Pacific Northwest, and solar in the Desert Southwest. And from the perspective of different demand profiles across the geographic footprint. This cooperation can take many forms, but I believe a regional transmission organization, or maybe a couple of regional transmission organizations in the region, would be a big part of the solution. And I'm well aware of the history associated with the Western energy crisis 20 years ago, and how that soured a lot of people in the region on developing an RTO and beyond California's borders. And while there has been a lot of progress, some of the, uh, the EIM, for instance, um, much more work remains. And in my opinion, the time is ripe for the states, the region's utilities, and other key stakeholders to, to go ahead and finish the job. In the meantime, I look forward to the discussion we're going to have this afternoon and again tomorrow to assess how different parts of the West are addressing resource adequacy, to better understand the challenges of the region faces, and to discuss potential solutions. I'm hoping we're going to have a lively discussion with the panelists about the full range of options available to sat satisfy the region's resource adequacy needs. Again, I want to finish up by thanking everyone for agreeing to participate today and tomorrow. And uh, now I'm going to call on Commissioner Danley for his opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I uh, also want to thank everybody for participating today. Uh, these tech conferences are important, and I thank you for the effort in coming and appearing. Uh, I don't really have too much to say in opening except to mention the fact that, as people are aware, I've been for a while 
very concerned about resource adequacy in the West, not just in California, but throughout the entire region. And um, I think that part of that is because of market structures where there are markets, and then also because there has been a failure to recognize the actual operating characteristics of certain types of generation. Um, the Federal Power Act requires that we ensure reliability and that the rates that are, are uh, paid in our markets and, and to utilities are just and reasonable. And uh, that is the statutory burden that we bear. So between the, um, the, the, the misapprehension as the characteristics of generation and in some cases, lack of critical infrastructure that's necessary, there are serious problems uh, facing the West and I am very much looking forward to this discussion because I think it's gonna be quite illuminating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Danley. Commissioner Clements. Thank you, Chairman Glick, and thanks again for setting up another really important set of conversations um, with a really esteemed group of panelists. I look forward to hearing from you all today. Thank you to staff for the hard work that went into getting that group together uh, and, and making this all happen. Uh, the chairman spoke to the extreme uh, circumstances in the West that you all are experiencing and um, the opportunities maybe that we have going forward. I'm certainly encouraged by the conversations that have been happening about increased resource adequacy coordination. I'm happy to see the market coordination efforts like the EIM um, bear fruit in, in the form of benefits and customer savings and, and now the, the stand up of the WISE uh, market as well. And I think the last six years that I spent living in Utah before I started here at the commission and observing some of these processes affirmed for me the perspective that states and utilities and the folks here today and other stakeholders across the West are working in good faith towards resource adequacy constructs and market development efforts designed or intended to imbue cost savings and reliability. And as, as the chairman mentioned, the California energy crisis for many years, this commission has been wise to respect those processes and, and not work to scare off progress from the East. Um, the urgency has changed. The urgency of efforts towards broader regional integration has changed in the last six year, in the last year, even in the last six months. The shared goals of ensuring reliability against these extreme weather threats, uh, the goals of meeting state policy mandates requirements, and the goals of protecting customers in the process require continuing progress towards full regional integration. And it's no secret that I, like the chairman, believe that well-designed regional markets and in this case, designed by Westerners for Westerners, is the best path forward to protect customers and ensure reliability while addressing resource adequacy concerns and the other serious challenges facing the West. Transparent market design, inclusive and fair governance, and effective system planning are necessary components of a regional market that will provide the cost savings, the reliability, the renewables integration, and the economic develop, development benefits that we must achieve. So between here and there, I'm certainly looking forward to the, the panels over the next two days uh, to hear all your perspectives on, on how to best meet these challenges ahead. Thank you, and back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Kovacs. Commissioner Christie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to hearing all the great panelists. It's a great lineup. I want to thank the staff for, for doing all the work that, that you did to put this together. Uh, a really impressive list of panels. Uh, a lot of very creative things happening in the West with, with uh, state arrangements, state agreements, and state uh, creativity. Uh, had occasion yesterday to meet um, with the Northwest Power Pool folks and hear about uh, their ideas and, and uh, been a lot of time with Kaiso over the last few months. Uh, other util and uh, utilities in the West. A lot of creative, um, a, lot of, a lot of creative initiatives taking place, which are really interesting. And I look forward to hearing more about them today. So again, thank you uh, to the staff for putting together this together, this great lineup. And I just look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Christie. Uh, we're going to begin our first panel now, which is we're going to uh, consider uh, and uh, hear from different folks as to what the different resource adequacy frameworks are around the West, and that'll get us started. And Naveen is going to kick it off. Thank you, Chairman Glick, and to all the commissioners. We now begin panel one of this technical conference. In this first panel, 
Each panelist will introduce themselves and present opening remarks of no longer than eight minutes. After that, we will begin a question and answer session with the commissioners and the panelists. Please note that we don't intend to discuss the specific details or merits of any pending contested proceedings before the commission. And we ask that all participants similarly refrain from any such discussion to the extent possible. If any such issues might arise, my colleague Colin Beckman from the Office of General Counsel might interject into the discussion to ask the speaker to avoid that top particular topic. I will now call on each panelist in panel one in turn to give their opening remarks. First, we will have Mr. Jordan White, Vice President of Strategic Engagement and Deputy General Counsel for the Western Electricity Coordinating Council to kick off the conference of the West White Perspective. Please go ahead, Mr. White. Well, thank you, Naveen, and, and staff, um, and thank you to the chairman and commissioners for hosting this technical conference, and uh, greetings from out west. Um, as, as all the commissioners mentioned, resource adequacy is absolutely critical uh, for the West right now, and WAC appreciates your leadership on this topic. As mentioned, I'm Jordan White, Vice President of Strategic Engagement and Deputy General Counsel at the Western Electricity Coordinating Council, or WAC as we're known. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that works to effectively and efficiently, efficiently mitigate risk the reliability and security of the Western Interconnections bulk power system. This includes all or a portion of 14 uh, Western states, as well as the Canadian provinces of Alberta and British Columbia, and also the northern portion of Baja, California, and Mexico. Our authority to regulate and ensure the reliability of the Western Interconnection is delegated um, from the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or NERC, and of course, NERC's authority is delegated from the FERC. WEC brings a unique and independent perspective on resource adequacy um, and that we don't own or control assets and we are neutral with respect to resource type and policy. In short, our sole uh, focus is on the reliability and security of the Western grid. Rather than focusing on, a, on any specific state or subregion, we gather and analyze data for the entire interconnection and produce assessments that consider the interplay and interdependence of all balancing authorities uh, in the Western interconnection. We then take that information and share our insights with stakeholders, including policymakers and regulators in an effort to inform sound regulatory and policy decisions that enhance reliability. For many years, WEC has supported NERC in developing the long-term reliability assessment uh, mentioned by uh, the commissioners or the LTRA. That assessment looks at resource adequacy at a continent-wide level um, to identify potential risk. In 2020, at the request of our stakeholders, WEC developed a new Western Interconnection Focus Assessment called the Western Assessment of Resource Adequacy. That assessment complements the LTRA, but really takes a look at resource adequacy in the context of Western Interconnection challenges and conditions, and includes additional risk scenarios based upon import and export scenarios, and also different scenarios looking at potential reliability challenges associated with generation additions and retirement. The real headline of that assessment is that resource adequacy is becoming more challenged due to increased load and generation of variability. That variability is caused by a few factors, including a changing resource mix, um, going from traditional fossil based load resources to, of course, increased renewable generation with less predictable generation profiles. Variability is also increasing on the load side of the equation with extreme and less predictable weather more customer sided generation that is less visible, and the electrification of the transportation sector. Part of the challenge with this type of variability is that it does not necessarily sync up with the peak hour of the peak day, which means that the planning reserve margins tied to that peak do not necessarily capture all of the hours at risk, especially during those shoulder seasons when weather and hydro conditions can fluctuate greatly. This variability makes it very challenging to plan for and serve load because although the Western grid was designed to rely on the diversity of weather patterns and resources in the West, it's becoming more challenging to rely on the diversity um, with a high level of predictability. In other words, it's becoming more difficult for the desert Southwest to rely on historic weather patterns, allowing excess megawatts to flow south when it's cool up north. The other headline from WEX assessment has to do with imports. Many balancing authorities rely on market purchases to shore up their resource stacks to serve load. But there really isn't a good accounting mechanism to know who is counting on what purchases and when. Obviously, with high degrees of variability on the system, more load serving entities are going to be chasing the same megawatts at certain times. This means there may be times when balancing authorities 
are relying on power that does not materialize when needed. The other challenge associated with increasing reliance on imports is the necessary transmission capacity to move power to load. I know that transmission planning and coordination is something FERC is focused on right now, and WEC agrees that transmission is a key component of the resource adequacy solution puzzle. The increase in variability and reliance on imports is driving a need for change in how we both analyze and plan for resource adequacy. After WEC released the Western Assessment last December, we shared our findings and recommendations of stakeholders across the West, including industry leadership, policymakers, and state, state regulatory commissioners in all of the Western states. Our communication with this vast array of stakeholders has revealed several critical opportunities to, to coordinate efforts and increase the collective understanding of reliability issues related to resource adequacy. The three opportunities are in the areas of coordinating assessments, re-examining resource adequacy analyses and metrics, and information sharing. Our collective challenge is to plan a resource adequate systems many years in advance that is reliable in the real time. This will require the resource planning work that utilities and regulatory agencies currently are engaged in, and the work that it was going to be described today with respect to sub-regional programs will also help to move the needle in this effort. But a resource adequate, reliable Western interconnection will also require interconnection-wide coordination. This coordination could occur in many ways, but ultimately there's a strong need for a, a neutral entity to either knit together existing assessments or create a new assessment that would fully capture the interplay and interdependence of the Western interconnection. Part of that knitting would, would include a sync up of assessment timeframes and data sets to get an accurate and full picture of resource adequacy in the West. The assessment would also need to be sufficiently granular and transparent to serve as a fund foundational tool for resource um, adequacy planning, operation, and of course, decision making. In addition, the vast and rapid changes of, of uh, how we plan and operate the system requires us to re-examine and update our analytical frameworks and metrics for assessing and measuring resource adequacy. For example, with thinning capacity margins and increased interregional reliance on import, there's a heightened need for load serving entities to understand how and when they can count on resources to serve load. Currently, the lack of con consistency across the West with respect to load forecasting and capacity contribution metrics creates a challenge to resource planning and operation. Uh, there are several efforts in this area, including the Northwest Power Pool that we discussed today, doing some good work in this area, but ultimately will require an interconnection-wide uh, effort. Finally, it is imperative that information is available to and received from the right people through outreach and stakeholder engagement. Ultimately, putting solid, consistent, independent, and actionable data in the hands of decision makers is key to addressing the challenges we are facing in the West. WEC, WEC believes that these, um, uh, th these opportunities can be seized and stands ready to partner with stakeholders to address resource adequacy challenges. In the last year and a half, we have bolstered our strategic engagement and resource adequacy analytical capabilities. And using the lessons and input from stakeholders, we are improving and expanding our Western assessment tool. We have a long history of working with stakeholders on difficult and critical issues, and we're ready to do it again. As an independent, interconnection-wide body, WEC is poised to partner with stakeholders to address the resource adequacy challenges that are critical to the 80 million customers of the West that depend on reliable electric service. And I just want to pause here for a moment um, and acknowledge that when I use the term load, what I'm really talking about is the people that, you know, that, are, that so vitally depend on the electric service for the, for the benefit of their lives. I just want to make sure we don't decide that. With that, I'll conclude my comments, and I really look forward to the discussion over the next couple of days, and, um, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Nadine. Thank you very much, Mr. White. Next, we will have Greg Carrington, Chief Operating Officer of Northwest Power Pool. Mr. Carrington has some slides to supplement his presentation, which we will load momentarily. Once the slides are loaded, please um, you can begin, Mr. Carrington, and as you make your remarks, please indicate when you want the slide to be advanced. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Um, so my name is Greg Carrington. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Northwest Power Pool. And today I wanted to just provide an overview of what the Northwest Power Pool and the steering committee from the various utilities have been doing. Uh, we started this effort in June of 2019 and we're in June of 20. 
uh, one, and we've made great progress so far. One thing I did want to mention is that we are going to be having a symposium uh, of what we're working on on August 3rd. Uh, some of the uh, FERC commissioners have been invited to that symposium. So move on to the next slide, please. So the, the next slide is going to be a map, and it's going to show you generally uh, the area and the entities that have been working on the resource adequacy program. You can see here that we span across two Canadian provinces and 10 states. Uh, the areas in color are the entities that have been participating in the program design. The crosshash areas are um, entities that haven't participated yet but have expressed an interest in learning more about that. And you can see on the eastern side of it, it's the WAPA regions haven't participated yet, and then we have Alberta that hasn't participated quite yet. Just for a point of reference, our peak load is about 50% higher than the California load, about 50% higher than SPP, and about three times the amount of the desert southwest. So our peak load is somewhere right around 86,000 megawatts. Next slide, please. So why are we doing this? Um, as you all have mentioned, uh, the grid is changing considerably. On the lower right-hand side of this, it shows you what states are working on what uh, resource portfolios or clean energy standards or whatever they may be. Uh, we know that there is a high degree of um, uh, you know, uh, desire to, re uh, to reduce the use of um, fossil fuels. Uh, there are a lot of coal plants that are closing down. A lot of gas plants are not being built. As a result of that, in the upper right-hand corner of this graph, you can see how our region is affected by this. Uh, we conducted a study as part of our initial investigation. Uh, it was done by E3, and you can see that the area, and this is just for the four northern states, it isn't for the entire footprint, you can see that we expect to go from what we consider to be a capacity-rich um, scenario to a capacity deficit in the very near future, if not today. The other thing I would like to point to is the third bullet down. Uh, when we originally did our survey of the utilities, we quickly came to the conclusion that uh, all utilities are looking at reliability differently. They all use different metrics. They use different modeling. Uh, they assess uh, the value and the contribution of different resources in different ways. Uh, our goal on all of this is to develop a uniform set of standards, a uniform way of looking at it, a uh, uniform way of looking at load and resources. And if we do it right, uh, the program benefits on the fourth bullet down, we're going to increase the reliability of the region. Uh, we're going to save our ratepayers and our customers money as a result of this because of the broad diversity across our footprint. And then most importantly, uh, there's going to be increased transparency and visibility across the grid. And I'll explain why that will happen. Uh, mostly, the thing that we're interested in doing is situational awareness. Today, we have a lot of balancing authority and load serving entities that operate individually without having the visibility across the grid. And I think Jordan White did a really good job at describing, you know, some of the issues that we're seeing today. So next slide, please. So uh, what are some of the problems and some of the issues that we have to deal with in our area? First of all, we don't have an IT, ISO or an RTO in our region. So this is a group of utilities that are getting together voluntarily. They realize that resource adequacy is an issue and we're working together to develop a program. This is very similar to what the Northwest Power Pool does for contingency reserve sharing, frequency response, and so forth. And so we're gonna continue that tradition of the Northwest Power Pool utilities getting together. The other issue that we have in our region is that we really don't have a grid operator or market operators. So as part of this program, we're proposing to stand up an operator that will be able to execute this program. We'll have the visibility across the footprint and be able to provide information to us. Uh, the other issue that we have is there's really no great examples for governance uh, for a bilateral type of arrangement like this. Uh, we went out and we took a look across the U.S. We looked at Europe and we looked at Australia and we took 
kind of the best of the best, the most um, industry best practices, and we're modeling it after that. Uh, and then the last bullet here, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, there's lot, as you all know, there's large amounts of hydropower. What we discovered is um, run of river hydropower is devaluated in the other regions across the U.S., but large hydropower with large amounts of storage has a different capacity value. So we had to go in and develop a standard for large, large hydro as well. Next slide, please. So um, just some points to think about as I'm talking about the design. Uh, we're not developing a market. This is going to be a bilateral uh, market. We're, we're setting it up. Uh, neighbors helping neighbors is really what our theme is on all of this. We expect that 99% of the time uh, capacity will be traded on a bilateral basis in order for people to achieve the standards that we are setting for ourselves. Um, we really need to have broad participation of all of the people across the footprint in order to maximize the diversity benefits. And the diversity benefits come not only from the generation um, amount of diversity, but also because of the load diversity. We have um, one area in, in the north which has a peak winter season, and then to the south we have a summer peak as well. And then the finally, final thing that I wanted to uh, point out on the last bullet here is that the RA program is being designed to be neutral towards resource type. We, uh, and it's also being designed to be neutral to state's authority to um, define resource planning, to define um, the portfolio standards and the green standards and so forth. So each state uh, and the program is being set up to be able to handle each state's different types of resource types that they want to have in, in their area. Next slide, please. So uh, we will be publishing a design a document soon. It's over 200 pages. And this is the only slide that is here that describes the 200 pages. So let me uh, spend a little bit of time on this slide. Um, as I mentioned, there's two seasons, a winter peak and a summer peak. Uh, and there are two time horizons for each peak. Seven months prior to the peak season, entities will be submitting notebooks to the program operator. Those notebooks will prove that they have um, um, the right amount of resources to meet their peak load plus a factor of safety, like which we're calling the planning reserve margin. If those entities are short in any way, the program operator will give them two months to cure that deficit, and then we begin the program itself. Then we move into the operational time frame. And as we are um, approaching each peak season, the program operator will be evaluating the, um, the grid and making a determination as to whether people need to keep the capacity for the benefit of sharing among the parties. If it turns out that the region is long, the program operator will release that capacity and people will be able to sell the capacity in the day ahead of the real-time market. If it turns out that we are actually getting into a capacity critical situation, the program operator will put people on notice. Uh, they will let people know the amount of capacity that needs to be shared. And those that are long will be keeping that in reserve and be holding that. And those that are short will be uh, ready to receive it if they need help. When we move into the day ahead or into real time, the program operator will then either release it or will um, uh, help with the sharing event if it is needed. So that is uh, a lot. Uh, that's basically modeled after some of the best resource adequacy programs that we've seen in the US. Next slide, please. Uh, so path forward. Uh, we know that everything is changing. We know that resource adequacy is an issue. This is a group of forward thinking utilities that know that resource adequacy is an issue and they know that they need to address the concerns that we've expressed here. Uh, the resource adequacy program is just the first step. Uh, we're addressing the critical hours in this. We know that there are other issues that could come up. You know, energy program uh, is one thing that's been mentioned in the past as well. And uh, we're going to have other speakers on the panels that follow that are participating in the Northwest Power Pool. 
We have Bonneville Power Administration. We have Eugene Water and Electric Board. We have Chelan PUD. And we have Portland General that will be talking on other panels. Uh, they're going to talk about uh, regional support for the Northwest Power Pool effort. They'll talk about broad participation. Sarah Edmonds from Portland General is going to be talking about the governance. And again, we uh, plan on making this an open and transparent process. We anticipate stakeholder involvement. We anticipate stake involvement. And uh, uh, we, we um, Sarah will talk more about kind of the state involvement as she talks about her panel as well. So with that, uh, I will end my presentation. The one thing I did want to mention, there are some appendix slides that I've provided. So when these materials are distribu distributed, uh, you all can take a look at some of the details associated with the schedule and then some of the design parameters as well. So with that, I'll stop and turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Carrington. That was very informative. And just as a reminder, uh, we post all of the uh, supplemental material that the speakers have submitted to the conference webpage, uh, the same page where you find the video link for this webcast. So you can find all the information over there. Next, we have this Delphine, um, now next we have Ms. Delphine Hope from the California um, Independent System Operator Corporation. Ms. Hope, please go ahead. Great, thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Chairman Glick, Commissioners, and FERC staff for inviting the CAISO. My name is Delphine Ho, Director of California Regulatory Affairs at the California Independent System Operator. As many of you know, CAISO is the balancing authority that oversees reliability of, of approximately 80% of California's electricity demand and a small portion of Nevada. And uh, within our footprint, there are both publicly owned utilities as well as investor owned utilities. So there's quite a mix. Uh, we manage the high voltage transmission system, operate the wholesale electricity market. And as was mentioned earlier, um, via the uh, Western imbalance energy market, uh, we have a wider footprint in the real time um, operational space. For my opening remarks, I want to focus on some of the broader themes that the CAISO has been seeing in the last uh, couple of years. And it sounds like increasingly so, those are similar things that are being seen across the rest of the West. So we do welcome uh, a lot of that um, same thinking, if we're seeing the same things, to have that coordination and foster that additional dialogue. So CAISO operates under a unique construct to ensure there are adequate resources to operate the grid within the CAISO's BA footprint. The construct is one that is, by definition, a collaborative effort. And we're working very closely with state entities and local regulatory authorities, in particular, the California Public Utilities Commission. And we welcome the participation of Director Scala today on the panel, on this panel, as well as the California Energy Commission and the participation of Commissioner Gunda on the panel later on today. And this close-knit relationship is essential, if not critical, as we address the challenges from climate change and really try to foster that rapid transition that we're seeing from you know, very conventional, centrally located thermal-based resources uh, to one that has a significant penetration of renewables, uh, availability limited or energy limited resources, both those that are connected to the transmission grid and at the distribution and customer side. Now, as mentioned, as was mentioned earlier, there are also significant changes occurring on the demand side as well. And we already see that with significant penetrations of behind the meter solar, transportation electrification, varying um, time of use rates or dy more dynamic rates, um, as well as increasingly so across uh, various California footprints, uh, fuel substitution. And uh, rapidly that is being reflected in uh, building electrification. So critically, we're together addressing the needs to consider resource adequacy, not just at the peak hour of a year or a month or even a day, but really across all hours of the day and year. And I just want to note that this is a real turning point for any resource adequacy discussion and construct because it has been defined thus far looking at a single peak or some critical point in time rather than across time. And this highlights also the importance of energy um, as uh, the, the real focus versus just capacity in ensuring reliable electric service. So those are the main things that I wanted to um, establish because a lot of what we 
are looking at today are legacy constructs that were developed many years ago. And we are really at that, as I mentioned, turning point, but also at an inflection point where we are reimagining what those programs and what those constructs are today in order to prepare ourselves for tomorrow. Much of that work has already started. Uh, we are seeing more reliability-based um, accounting methodologies, uh, things that we'll touch upon probably later in this panel, as well as uh, press from remarks from Director Scala. That's been a very collaborative effort to increase our awareness and look at the many hours uh, of the year. But again, we've started on that process, but we need to make additional progress. Lastly, I'll note, because the KISO is part of an interconnected and interdependent electricity system in the Western United States, uh, we do feel that it's very important and critical to ensure that there is coordination and dialogue with the other balancing authorities in, in the West to make sure that we meet the electric demand and reliability, uh, given all of these changes that we're seeing both within climate change because of changing demand use patterns and because of the changing supply that we're seeing on the grid, uh, as well as at the distribution and consumer side. So I'll end with these brief remarks. Thank you. <laughs> Very well, thank you, Ms. Ho. That was very informative as well. Next up, we will have Alice Jackson, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Public Service Company of Colorado. Ms. Jackson also has a few slides to supplement her presentation for this panel, which we will load momentarily. Ms. Jackson, please um, go ahead and indicate when you would like to have us advance the slides. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning to those of you who are joining me in the mountain uh, region and west. Uh, good afternoon to those of you to our east. Um, it's really a pleasure to join you today. I thought the opening comments from the chairman and the other commissioners were very poignant and well positioned for what it is that we're facing here in the west. And I believe with my comments, you'll see that we have a, a true testing ground here in Colorado for the transition that is ongoing, as well as some of the pieces of the puzzle that we've had to evolve and um, really iterate from our last several rounds of electric resource planning. Next slide, please. For those of you less familiar with Excel Energy, we operate in eight states throughout the central U.S., from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan down to um, southeast New Mexico. Um, I have the pleasure of serving as the president of Excel Energy Colorado, which means that my remarks today will primarily focus on the Colorado region. Um, however, across all eight of our states, Excel Energy does have aggressive goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. For Piesco specifically, we expect to achieve approximately an 85% carbon reduction from our 2005 levels by 2030. And the results, if they come out to the direction that we have proposed to our commission, would end up with delivering roughly 80% of the kilowatt hours to our customers in the state of Colorado from renewable energy resources in that same time frame. However, for across our our organization, for more than a decade, we've demonstrated leadership on clean energy and reducing carbon emissions. Since 2005, we've reduced carbon emissions 51% across our eight states and have plans for more under our industry-leading carbon goals. And in 2020, we had our largest single-year drop in carbon emissions ever. By 2030, our goal is to reduce emissions across all eight of those states again by 80% from those 2005 levels. And by 2050, we are aspiring to serve our customers in all of our states with 100% carbon-free electricity. Now, this is going to take a lot of work. Uh, while we can reach the 2030 goal today with existing technology, um, we do see that beyond 2030, we're going to have to continue to look at um, how do we evolve these technologies while we're increasing renewables on the system, we also need zero carbon dispatchable resources, which continues to be a strong focus of our efforts today because we need that work to continue in order to be successful beyond 2030. Next slide, please. To dive a little bit deeper into how the planning is occurring out here in the West, specifically in Colorado, we have our electric resource planning process in the state of Colorado. And effective resource planning is key to achieving our clean energy goals in a timely, reliable, and cost-effective manner. And carbon reductions are now one of the primary drivers of our resource planning efforts. In Colorado, resource planning for vertically integrated utilities and electric cooperative GNTs as of 2020 is overseen by the Public Utilities Commission of Colorado. The commission does not, however, have authority over resource planning for munis and cooperatives. The RP occurs roughly every four years and is conducted in two phases. The first phase identifies our resource needs. The second phase evaluates options to fulfill those needs identified in phase one. Phase one of the Colorado process is fully litigated and usually takes roughly a year. Phase two is not litigated, but it's overseen by an independent evaluator. 
This phase can take 300 days or longer. So we're really talking about roughly a two-year process from the start of an electric resource plan to the conclusion of deciding which resources are going to be put in place. Although the PUC in includes demand-side resources in its definition of resources, historically the ERP has focused solely on supply-side generation resources. Acquisition of demand-side resources occurs in separate proceedings, and the outcomes of those separate proceedings are an input into our electric resource planning process. However, the importance of the capacity and energy delivered from demand-side resource proceedings should not be diminished. For example, we expect nearly 1,200 megawatts of demand-side resources to be added to our system between now and 2030, whether in rooftop solar or community solar gardens. We have to be able to depend on these resources to meet the reliability needs of our system and our customers. Transmission planning also occurs outside the ERP process. However, if new transmission investment is required to acquire specific supply side resources, the estimated costs for those projects are included in the evaluation and selection of the bid portfolios. If a bid portfolio is selected by the PUC that requires new transmission investment, uh, we have to go before the commission for our certificates of public convenience and necessity for that transmission, and they are filed after the electric resource plan. On March 31st of 2021, we filed our next round of our electric resource planning here in Colorado, which is looking at achieving all the way through 2030. So not only determining the needs of the system through 2030, but fulfilling the resources that are necessary in order to achieve the carbon reduction goals that I previously mentioned. There are, however, some pretty interesting and in detailed uh, pieces of the puzzle that we have to talk about that add into how do we plan for our system. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Planning reserve margin is one of the key components and inputs into the resource planning process. Piesco's planning reserve margin was set at 16.3% in 2008, and it continues at that same value today. We have reevaluated, however, our plan and reserve margin in the ongoing electric resource plan that I previously mentioned, and we are proposing to the commission that that needs to increase to roughly 18%. This value is subject, of course, to the approval of the Colorado Public Utilities Commission. The reasons for updating our planning reserve margin are things you've heard uh, people talking about today, and they revolve around a number of factors, including more sophisticated analytical tools um, that have been developed since the margin was last updated in 2008, a change in the planning standard to a more rigid one event and 10 year value, and use of a more representative sample of correlations between load, solar, and wind energy. Those variable energy resources are driving some of the need to have a higher planning reserve margin, especially when you're talking about planning for 8,760 hours a year with the variable energy resources versus what we did a decade ago, which was planning for one hour a year, which was the peak on the system. One factor that our planning reserve margin that does not take into account is the resource position of the other entities in the PSCO balancing authority. So aside from being the largest um, provider of energy in the state of Colorado, we are also the balancing authority with many other customers, whether they're wholesale customers of ours, munis and co-ops um, that are independently run, or customers of GNTs in the area. And so that has to be taken into account in our balancing authority, but they do not participate in the electric resource planning process. Electric cooperatives and municipal utilities are self-governed and not subject to any form of resource planning. For Piesco as a balancing authority, this creates significant concern because Piesco is the provider of last resort for energy and capacity for ener entities that may not have made adequate arrangements to meet their energy and capacity needs. We are concerned that energy imbalance charges from the balancing area won't be enough to incent these entities to make sure that they have adequate capacity to serve their needs. Also, we're already seeing creativity when it comes to looking at arbitrage on the pricing side. And we have wholesale customers who are looking to um, add resources to their systems that would avoid capacity um, payments to their wholesale providers. But at the same time, that capacity may not necessarily be there um, in the event of storms or lack of wind on the system. Here again, because Piesco is the provider of last resort for capacity needed for large wind fall off events on third party systems, we have to take that into consideration. These factors in combination are creating significant stresses on our capacity and we face the potential at some point to have insufficient capacity to meet the needs of all of the load serving entities on our system. This situation will worsen as electrification and renewable additions continue without adequate and resource planning. Some sort of relief valve is needed for balancing authorities like Piesco that are the provider of last resort for these reserves. We view the Northwest Power Pools Resource Adequacy Initiative and we are actively participating in that activity because we believe that it will help close the gap on some of these items. To one of the points that was spoken to before, next slide please, I think it's important to look at how do we evaluate the resources on our system. 
Effective load carrying capacities of the resources on our system is an important aspect of the resource planning process. We use the Plexus model to evaluate the ELCC of resources on our system and determine the incremental loads that a resource can serve without degrading reliability. Our prior ELCC evaluations looked at the interrelationship of wind and solar and the declining ELCC values of wind and solar with their increased penetration. For the most recent ERP filed this year, we are adding storage to our view of ELCCs to understand the implications of more storage on our system. As you can see from this chart, the ELCC values of incremental additions of these resources decrease as more is added to the system in particular storage. And I'm happy to dive into this a little bit more um, in the Q&As if people are interested. Next slide, please. However, I can't conclude my comments this morning without speaking about transmission. Today, import capacity plays a fairly limited role in the Colorado system's resource planning process. This photograph, which is used frequently, uh, reflects a key difference between load distribution in the eastern part of the U.S. compared to the west. In general, there is a much greater distance between major load centers in the west than in the east and a much lower population density in the west, except for California. Due to these differences, transmission link linkages between states in the West are relatively weak, with individual states and utilities largely dependent upon their own resources to meet load needs. In most cases, the rights to transmission that does exist are fully subscribed. The fairly limited transmission ties to other areas is further magnified in Colorado, which is on the eastern edge of the Western interconnection and has limited access to resources in the Eastern interconnection. As we consider including resources beyond our Colorado borders in our electric resource planning processes, we find that both limited transmission availability and distance of potential resources from our borders generally make them unsuitable for our resource planning needs. Importantly, the Commission could take steps to increase utilization of and reliance upon the transmission between states and utilities that does exist by requiring a transition away from the contract path methodology for managing transmission usage in the West outside of California. The contract path methodology results in underutilization of transmission in the West because it divides the transmission system into neat ownership packets to avoid any inadvertent sharing of capacity. But the, this also puts up barriers. Transmission reservations are based on these contract pathway packets. However, since much of the power actually flows on the paths that are not part of the contract path offered and sold by the transmission provider, much of the benefit of the interconnected system is withheld from use. We understand that APS is planning to transition from the contract path methodology to a flow-based methodology over the next several years. And we are looking at the potential for a transition, but it is challenging in PSCO due to the variety of transmission owners and jointly owned transmission in the state. We believe the commission could make headway in improving resource adequacy in the West by directing a transition from contract path to the same type of flow-based management of the transmission system used in the Eastern interconnection. Such a transition could take several years to accomplish, and I don't want to underestimate or uh, downplay the complexity of working on something like this, but by working through the existing legacy agreements, we think that there could be a substantial value in such a step uh, taken by this commission. So with that, thank you very much for having us here today. I look forward to the question and answers and appreciate being able to be on such an esteemed panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jackson, for those very thorough comments. Next up, we will have Mr. Frank Lawson, General Manager of the Eugene Water and Electric Board. Where is yours? Mr. Lawson, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Glick, Commissioners, and FERC staff. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this technical conference and for your leadership on this subject. My name is Frank Lawson. I'm the CEO and General Manager of Eugene Water and Electric Board, often called EWEB. Uh, EWEB is a small public utility serving approximately 200,000 people in the southern Willamette Valley of Oregon uh, with a power portfolio that is already 90% carbon free. Uh, with an average all-in price to customers of approximately 11 cents per kilowatt hour, including fixed T&D charges. Uh, we are a load serving entity, transmission owner and operator, generator owner and operator, and we are within Bonneville's balancing authority area. EWEB is a BPA block and slice customer. Presently, we receive about 70% of our power from BPA. The remainder comes from resources that we own, including hydroelectric facilities within the Willamette Basin and wind projects throughout the Pacific Northwest, and some through power purchase agreements. Uh, overall, on an annual basis, EWEB is about 30% surplus long on energy, 
Uh, but at times we are seasonally short on energy and often short on capacity. So eWeb is a good example of utilities that really, you know, we cannot fly through the mountains at average altitude. Uh, so we have to plan for the peaks. Although small relative to the Western Interconnect, uh, eWeb does have a full trading operation and we provide power trading services for other utilities. Uh, we trade on a real-time, hourly, bilateral basis, day ahead, balance a month, next month, and we financially hedge as far as five years out. Our trading operation will be impacted by Bonneville's joining of the Cal ISO energy imbalance market, and at least one of our resources will likely become a participating resource within that Bonneville footprint. Because of changes in resource and regulatory landscapes across the West, uh, EWEB's hedging strategy is moving from mitigating for market softness or kind of depressed prices to mitigating for market volatility. Uh, within uh, this summer, as an example, we're dealing with pricing excursions uh, being experienced across the West, and we're having to mitigate for that. Uh, from a load or customer perspective, uh, we are anticipating a greater than 20% increase in energy load. Uh, because of electrification over the next 10 years and potentially a 60 to 80 percent increase in peak load because of electrification. Um, overall, it is important to note that eWeb really relies on market liquidity to optimize uh, and maintain our reliability or the physics of it uh, and also to avoid large balancing charges um, important really to our affordability in our local economy. Um, EWEB is governed by a five-member publicly elected board. Uh, our integrated resource planning, operating reserve margins, risk management, trading practice, those are all governed by our local board. Uh, other than state and federal requirements, uh, including EWEB's compliance with the Oregon Renewable Portfolio Standard, uh, or those that are influenced by being part of uh, Bonneville's balancing authority area. Uh, as an example, we generally keep about a 6% hourly reserve margin uh, to avoid uh, the risk of balancing charges. Uh, and more recently, we are entering our trading period slightly longer than we would at historic levels uh, because of the emerging price volatility. So we're hedging and planning uh, for a change in that um, uh, market um, liquidity. Uh, we are also predicting electrification impacts on that going forward. Um, EWEB has been and continues to be an enthusiastic participant and supporter of the resource adequacy development work taking place in the Pacific Northwest as described earlier by Mr. Carrington. Uh, the warning signs are there uh, that this effort is really essential for us. Um, first appearing really in the form of modeling and data uh, followed by real-world pricing excursions that we're already seeing uh, and eventually leading to physics issues, you know, in the form of reliability impacts and rolling blackouts that we saw last year in, in California. Um, these, I would call these heart palpitations, tell us uh, we cannot continue business as usual. Uh, replacing firm and dispatchable resources, uh, including moratoriums on natural gas across the West, with those dispatched by Mother Nature, like wind and solar, while important in mitigating atmospheric carbon, requires utilities, including BPA, our balancing authority, or authority uh, regulators, and lawmaker, lawmakers to all work together uh, to keep the system reliable and affordable. In order to meet these types of challenges, we have to leverage the diversity uh, that we see across the West we have to develop common standards that can be transparent between utilities. We have to eventually develop and organize markets, and we truly need to optimize the transmission grid. Uh, many utilities are stepping up, uh, including consumer and investor-owned entities, and through the really fine progress being made by the Northwest Power Pool-led effort, uh, we are working on a resource adequacy program that will have broad benefits for the Western United States power system. Uh, this is historic. Uh, this is a historic level of cooperation. Um, as members of the energy sector, uh, we live in the land of and. Uh, we have to be safe and reliable and affordable and environmental. 
Uh, it makes it all challenging, rewarding, and important. Uh, and so, commissioners, with that, thank you for the opportunity to provide these general opening remarks. And I'll look forward to answering any specific questions or uh, further discussion later on. So, with that, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lawson. Next up, we will have Mr. Director of Efficiency, Electrification, and Procurement for the California Public Utilities Commission. Mr. Scala, please go ahead. Thank you, Nevin. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Glick and Commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this panel today, <clears throat> and I look forward to uh, hearing more from uh, this panel and the future panels because this is uh, quite a lineup over the next two days. Uh, as Delphine uh, from Kaiso mentioned, about 20% of uh, California's load is located outside of the Kaiso, uh, made up largely of LADWP and Sacramento Util Municipal Utility District load. And about 10% of the load inside the Kaiso is regulated by local reliability authorities other than the PUC, POUs, tribes, or government entities such as WAPA. The resource adequacy framework I'll be describing today applies to load that is under PUC jurisdiction, so about 70% of California's load. Uh, and heads up that there are a few areas in which the information I'll be covering overlap with information that Delphine provided, but I think they actually fit together pretty well. Um, so the PUC addresses resource adequacy in two time horizons. For forward planning, in a time frame that ensures there is enough steel in the ground, so, so generally in the four to 10 year time horizon, the PUC uses a statutorily mandated integrated resource planning process that requires all load serving entities or LSEs to plan for and procure the resources needed to serve their share of load reliably and that collectively also support California's climate goals. In the one to three year time horizon, the PUC implements a resource adequacy compliance program, also statutorily mandated that requires LSEs to have sufficient resources under contract to meet their share of forecasted peak load. These two programs are needed to, uh, both needed to ensure reliability. There's not enough time nor enough of a payment stream in the RA program's one to three year time horizon to support the development of new resources. <clears throat> the RP program is implemented on a recurring two year cycle. The first year determines the uh, appropriate GHG emission planning target for the electricity sector and identifies the optimal mix of resources to meet those GHG goals and reliability needs. The second year of the IRP cycle allows the PUC to consider the portfolios that each load serving entity proposes for meeting these goals, to aggregate the individual portfolios into a single system wide portfolio, <clears throat> and to consider whether further action is needed beyond what each LSC is planning in order to meet GHG and reliability goals. In addition to this longer term planning track, the IRP also has a procurement track. <clears throat> in 2019, uh, that track ordered LSCs to procure 3,300 megawatts of net qualifying capacity that must begin delivery uh, this summer through 2023, and a procurement track uh, order for over 11,000 megawatts of additional capacity for the 2023 through 2026 timeframe is the subject of a proposed decision which the Commission is scheduled to vote on tomorrow. In accord also, in accordance with a 2010 uh, MOU with the CAISO, the PUC also provides resource portfolios to CAISO's transmission planning process during the first quarter of each year, a task that is now incorporated into the IRP planning cycle. <clears throat> These portfolios can trigger the need for new transmission investment should CAISO analysis identify such needs. Turning now to the Resource Adequacy Compliance Program. While this program is designed and overseen by the PUC, it relies on three entities who each play a role in its implementation. The California Energy Commission prepares and adopts the electricity demand forecasts that are used to benchmark individual LSEs RA requirements. The PUC then sets the requirements and enforces compliance with the program. The CAISO enforces the RA must offer obligation and performs backstop procurement if sufficient capacity is not procured or available. Currently, there are three different RA requirements designed to ensure sufficient capacity is contracted to reliably operate the system. There's a system RA requirement that ensures enough megawatts of capacity are contracted and available to meet peak system load based on a monthly 
forecasted one and two peak load with a 15% planning reserve margin. Resources that can count towards system requirements include internal resources that are on the CAISO's net qualifying capacity list, um, pseudo-tied and dynamically scheduled imports, and firm energy imports that are paired with import allocation rights. There is also a local RA requirement to ensure that there is sufficient capacity contracted in transmission constrained areas to serve local load reliably. This requirement is determined annually by CAISO and adopted by the PUC based on a 1 in 10 forecast. Internal resources that are physically located in a locally constrained area and are on the net qualifying capacity list must be used to meet this requirement. Finally, there's a flexible RA requirement that ensures there is sufficient flexible capacity contracted and available to meet the net load ramp resulting from the increased penetration of intermittent resources. This requirement is determined based on the largest three hour net load ramp for each month and resources that have the ability to ramp and sustain energy output for three hours that are on CAISO's flexible capacity list must be used to meet this requirement. There have been several changes to the RA program in recent years. In 2019, the Commission expanded the one-year local RA requirement to three years, and with this change, LSEs must meet 100% of their year one and year two requirements and 50% of the year three requirements. To address market power issues in transmission-constrained areas, in 2020, the PUC further determined that PG&E and Southern California Edison should serve as central procurement entities responsible for this three-year forward local capacity procurement in their respective territories beginning in 2023. LSEs with local capacity under contract may bid that capacity into the CPE solicitations where they can simply show it to reduce the collective local requirements while also using the retained resource to meet their own system and flexible requirements. Also in 2020, the PUC clarified requirements for using resources outside CAISO for system RA capacity. The requirements differ on whether or not the import is resource specific. Resource specific RA imports must be pseudo tied or dynamically scheduled with some kinds of visibility and control. Uh, where, whereas non resource specific RA imports must be energy contracts with energy delivered directly into the CAISO under contract with the load serving entity. More recently, in response to last August's rotating outages. The Commission has adopted an effective PRM of 17.5% for 2021 and 2022 summer RA. Under this new requirement, the IOUs are required to target procurement of an additional 2.5% of forecast peak load for all the load in their service territories with resources that can serve load during the net peak hour to achieve a collective 17.5% PRM when added to the individual LSE's 15% requirement. <clears throat> I've mentioned qual net qualifying capacity a few times already, and this is because the amount of capacity available to meet peak demand rather than a resources nameplate capacity is a key aspect of California's current RA framework. This net qualifying capacity determination varies by technology type and dispatchability value status. Resources that are dispatchable receive a qualifying capacity value based on the maximum power output or Pmax. Wind and solar facilities receive a qualifying capacity based on uh, the methodology that was previously referenced, uh, the effective load carrying capability that models the likelihood of loss of load using a one in 10 reliability criteria. In 2020, the NQC methodology for dispatchable hydro resources was modified to consider 10 years of historic bidding data to determine the QC value of a resource which better accounts for water use limitations. <clears throat> At this time, dispatchable hydro resources can choose whether to use PMAX or the new methodology. And if they use PMAX, they are subject to CAISO penalties for non-performance, whereas if they use the new methodology, they're not. All resources have a must offer obligation into CAISO markets consistent with their net qualifying capacity value, ensuring that resources are bidding into the market available for its contracted RA. The bidding requirements also allow the resource to reflect use limitations in each bid. Complementing uh, these requirements, uh, there, the PUC enforces a, a maximum cumulative capacity bucket system that, lim um, that limits the amount of use-limited resources in each LSE's portfolio. 
Finally, in terms of enforcement, the PUC may issue penalties for LSE noncompliance, including both failure to meet requirements, which we refer to as deficiencies, and failure to make filings when it is directed. If deficiencies are cured with, within five business days, the penalty is $5,000 for a deficiency of under 10 megawatts, uh, $10,000 uh, for greater than 10 megawatts, and these fines double for subsequent deficiencies. If the deficiencies are not cured within five business days, the fines increase dramatically to close to $9 a kilowatt month for the summer months, uh, which we uh, treat as May through October, and half this for the winter months for system capacity, uh, an additional $4 a kilowatt month for local deficiencies, and $3 per kilowatt month for flexible deficiencies. There is a waiver process for local deficiencies, but not for system or flexible. Finally, performance penalties for not meeting resource must offer obligations are handled by the CAISO's uh, RA availability incentive mechanism. That's a, an RA 101 summary of the PUC's resource adequacy regime. And, uh, with that, I'll wrap up. Look forward to questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Scala. This is our last panelist for panel one which will be um, Mr. Jacob Tetlow, Executive Vice President of Operations for the Arizona Public Service Company. Mr. Tetlow, please go ahead. Thank you, Navin. Good afternoon. I'm Jacob Tetlow, the Executive Vice President of Operations at Arizona Public Service. APS is Arizona's largest electric utility, or an investor-owned and vertically integrated utility. As discussed earlier, we've been participating in the energy imbalance market in the West since 2016. I would like to thank the chairman and the commissioners for the opportunity to participate today, allowing me to discuss APS's approach to resource adequacy and the importance of providing reliable electric service to our customers. Arizona is known for its hot summers as we just set a record last week with six days in a row over 115 degrees. We have a booming economy. We have great population growth. Phoenix has been listed as the fastest growing city in the U.S. for the last five years. All of that makes us even that much more dependent on safe, reliable, and efficient electric system. As we all know, the bulk electric system is a complex, interconnected system. It's becoming increasingly critical to all of our customers who rely on us to make sure the grid runs smoothly every second of every day. As the grid continues to evolve to higher levels of distributed energy resources, today at APS, one in 10 customers now have rooftop solar. By per capita, we were second only to Hawaii and Arizona. And more and more carbon-free resources are added to our already 50% carbon-free energy mix. So our pro proactive approach to providing resource adequacy. I'm here today to specifically discuss our framework, the process, the mechanisms that we use to maintain resource adequacy in our service territory. We take this responsibility very seriously. Last summer in 2020, APS recorded another all-time peak load of 7,660 megawatts. That peak occurred on July 30th, which preceded the events related to the California rolling blackouts two weeks later. However, preparing for APS peak in the remainder of the summer required careful planning years in advance to make sure APS had the appropriate generation resources and delivery infrastructure in place to meet that peak and energy requirement. The Southwest where APS operates has experienced many changes over the last decade, including large variations in generation capacity due to build cycles, generation unit retirements, the lingering impacts of the Great Recession, large additions of renewable resources to our grid, not to mention the pandemic. Furthermore, we made a commitment to transition our fleet to delivering 100% clean energy to our customers by 2050, similar, similar to many of the others today, which will result in a substantial change from the way we operate our system today. Our participation today is intended to explain our rigorous planning techniques that allowed us to serve reliably, share our approaches to keep the lights on in Arizona as we move towards our clean energy future. The primary goal of planning the electric grid is to ensure adequate capacity and energy can be provided to make, meet the, the customer needs in a safe, cost-effective, and reliable manner under a variety of conditions. At APS, we start with an integrated resource process. In, our, in an IRP, our planners typically evaluate the current conditions of the grid, its components, and utilize forecasts and sophisticated models to simulate how the operations of the grid are expected to occur under future conditions while meeting the reliability criteria. Within the IRP, we utilize the same industry standard that's been talked about, similar to Excel, 
of a one in 10 cri criteria, one event in which a generation provider is unable to meet the load requirements over a 10 year period. That metric is often translated into percent capacity reserve margin. For example, a 15% reserve margin suggests that at APS, we would maintain firm resources of 115% above our load in order to cover that, that reliability. While planning and defining the resource levels are important, so too is making sure that the resources are developed in a timely fashion and that they're firm resources. We often say steel in the ground and are deliverable to our control area. First, all resources required to require a lead time. You have to scope it, you've got to bid it, evaluate, contract, build, and test prior to entering into service. The larger planning and acquisition process requires lead times that incorporate getting the new resources into service to meet our growing customer needs. Secondly, APS requires the vast majority of the resources to serve load to be real, asset-backed, physically available units. Financially firm products like firm power on the spot market have been shown to be inferior to asset-backed resources and may provide financial relief, but are not what keeps the lights on when the grid is stressed. Finally, our resource planners and transmission planners are coordinating to make sure that the delivery of firm energy is available to APS system, which is a process that contemplates energy needs in advance so the infrastructure is ready when it's needed. So we give a little additional background on the IRP process. The IRP rules are developed through a rulemaking process that includes the Arizona Corporation Commission. In Arizona, we have five elected officials that regulate the state's utilities. That coordination includes other utilities in the state and various stakeholders throughout the state. The IRP rules are administered by the Corporation Commission and require the utility to develop resource plans to use both demand and supply side resources to meet customer electricity needs. The IRP, IRP process is conducted on a two to three year basis to reflect changes in inputs, assumptions, and updates to the policy that might occur. For APS, the IRP is evaluated in two segments a five-year action plan window when decisions about resources must be made to maintain reliability. And secondly, a 15-year period where we identify trends and needs, potential retirements, broad electrical system changes, and evaluate the generation and infrastructure needs to maintain reliability for the longer term. Important details that are included in our resource plans are identifying the level of needs and incorporating resources that have known operating characteristics with a particular attention to lead times of each of those resources. As discussed earlier, once the, one, once the system level reliability needs are determined, APS utilizes an additional metric that's extremely important, the effective load carrying capability, which is critically important as it talks about variable resources to meet peak loads. This includes the solar, the wind, the energy storage. The ELCC is determined by comparing particular resources, capacity and megawatt to conventional capacity from a reliability perspective. The ELCC exercise identifies how much reliability contribution an individual resource has to the entire resource mix. For example, where we're very solar heavy in Arizona, approximately 25 to 35 percent of the install capacity. For example, if you have put in 100 megawatts of solar, you get about 25 to 35 megawatts of firm capacity. Once the IRP is defined, then we move to procuring the necessary resources through all source RFPs as needed to meet the objectives in the IRP. The resources identified may not be the same as the IRP, but will provide the same level of reliability and capacity. To supplement our long-term planning, APS continuously transacts physical power products in the short-term space, such as EIM. These transactions primarily aim to improve reliability across our summer months and respond to changes that are observed in load forecasts resource capability, and portfolio changes within the two-year window. And while APS develops plans to provide for customer-driven resource adequacy, the company also realizes it's part of a large interconnected system, and that interaction with neighboring utilities is both important and necessary. APS provides the information inputs to WEX reli regional reliability evaluation, but also coordination and cooperation on long-term planning, resource adequacy, has some unique challenges as utilities across the Southwest often utilize different metrics for reliability and resource adequacy. Additionally, coordination on standard WEC-based products to reflect the resource composition of the contracts is becoming more important. Traditionally, through the Western States Power Pool, Schedule C Power has been identified as firm and provided liquidated damages for failure to deliver. When the evolution of resources in the region and varied approaches to planning across the region, 
the composition of this standard product has evolved in some cases to resources that may be less firm or reliable in nature, such as load reductions or aggregated distributed resources. The outcome has been a divide between physically backed purchases and firm resources that are only financially backed. Methods to standardize products and operating practices across WEC participants and determining firmness of a resource would better support new technologies and products to develop that are well understood and create transparency between buyers and sellers. In summary, the metrics and the methodologies used to determine resource adequacy are complex in the calculation, but the rigor associated with such models is essential to providing reliable electricity to our customers. The tools that APS uses, such as the loss of load probability, the reserve margins, the ELCC, incorporate a number of historical observations and forward-looking assumptions that need to be continuously monitored to establish strong metrics in determining resource adequacy. While our approaches are rigorous in nature, there are new challenges that we need to stay ahead of, such as severe weather events that Chairman Glick talked about, the changing nature of our loads, new resource additions, and the limited nature of energy reserves associated with energy storage technologies. Interaction amongst planners and researchers is crucial to address the new issues that are identified across the electric utilities and sharing of information is essential. And finally, firm resources or steel on the ground, along with transmission and delivery in place to support the new resources is essential to the grid reliability and planning. Thank you for the opportunity to give my input. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Tetlow. Um, and that was the last panelist of uh, panel one. We will now begin the question and answer session. If a question is directed at a specific panelist of the panel, then please unmute yourself and respond to the question. If a panelist would like to answer a general question or make any supplementary remarks during discussion, please use the WebEx raise hand function to indicate you would like to speak. Alternatively, if you're having issues with the raise hand function, please turn on your microphone and indicate you would like to respond. We will then sequentially call upon panelists that indicated they wanted to respond. At that time, please turn your mic on, respond to the question, and please turn it off um, when you do finish your response. I will now hand it over to Chairman Glick to begin the question and answer session. Chairman Glick, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Naveen. I appreciate it. And again, thank you for all the interesting testimony today. Um, wanted to ask about, as several people mentioned, the 1 in 10 loss of load expectation metric that, that uh, is generally used or has been traditionally used in a number of utilities around the country. I'm wondering, given the change in conditions, the extreme weather, and definitely different, different types of generation resources that we're talking about, and maybe just public expectations as well in terms of expectations of loss of load. Um, I'm curious if you think one, the 1 in 10 standard is still the right standard to use or whether we need to consider a different approach. And uh, I'd like to direct this to everyone on the panel. Mr. Lawson, go ahead first, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Glick. I, I would say that uh, we use a number of different standards, one in two, one in 10, um, but based on the disruptive events that we've seen, and you, know, you, you mentioned heat earlier, but in the Northwest, we've also seen a number of ice storms in the last several years. Um, we are actually looking at a one in 20 or one in 25 uh, as a kind of a long-term disruptive event planning mechanism. So in our case, we are looking beyond one in 10 to include in our integrated resource planning and uh, in some cases, short-term planning. Thank you, Mr. Lawson. Um, Ms. Jackson, you're next, please. Thank you for the question. What I would say is that uh, customer expectations and consumer um, reliability is the number one request that they still have of us. And so, Chairman, from the perspective of our customers, the expectation is, is that we will try everything we possibly can to maintain, you know, the 99.98% reliability that we have delivered historically, regardless of the weather changes. I think that's accentuated even more after winter storm Yuri this year, the bomb cyclones we've experienced, as well as the heat waves and the general response that we've had from our consumers. Um, in the areas that the expectation for business, the economic impact is that the one in 10 is a reasonable expectation 
expectation for us to continue to plan towards um, and that anything less than that would be met with opposition. Um, anything more than that is good planning um, and looking at what the effectiveness is of the system that we have. But I think construction and expectation of setting it at the one in 10 is still appropriate. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Uh, Mr. Tetlow, you're up next, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a great question, Chairman Glick. I, I think it's the right question to ask, but I think it also depends on the other components that you put into that equation. And, and for us, we feel the one in 10 probability is the right place to be, but you have to complement that with addressing the things like the firm energy versus real assets or steel on the ground. In addition to that, we do, we do some modeling regionally and we will, we will flex up on that 15% on times where we see a peak coming and we see a regional heat wave coming to where I think you have to make some adjustments. So I think it's a good long-term planning criteria, but because of the risks you're articulating, there ought to be some, and needs to be some adjustments based on the highest risk situations and scenarios for unique times. And then you need certainty of the resources. Thank you, Mr. Tetlow. Mr. White, please go ahead. Yeah, but yeah, I just wanted to mention that, you know, the, the one in 10, the, the oddity standard is the standard that um, the WAC utilizes in its um, Western assessment. But, you know, it, there's nothing from our perspective that's necessarily uh, magical or set in stone about it. It's, it's just a risk threshold. And certainly the telecom industry has a much higher degree of threshold. But I think that the one point I want to make is that whatever, um, you know, risk insurance, because that's really what it comes down to is whether whether it's a discussion with the utility and the commission of what type of tolerance they want to have and, and what that means for their customers. I mean, ultimately that's got to be paired with that, that view towards the high degree of variability, which is really rapidly changing. So I think it's got to be a, a couple of discussion um, of both of the, both the, the thrift threshold, but also how it's applied um, across all the hours that um, Ms. Jackson talked about. So that's all I have, thanks. Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, Mr. Scala, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think it's it's a question we will be taking up and actually are already taking up in both of the, the uh, short term and long term processes I described in my opening comments. Uh, one thing that we have to keep in mind is there are different ways of, of accomplishing that insurance and we need to understand how they interact, right? We The planning reserve margin is intended to pick up some of the weather variability uh, and, and uh, we, we just needed to, to determine which levers we want to turn and not not kind of get crosswise with turning too many of them at the same time. So, um, uh, but it's, it, you know, and, and obviously also trying to to balance uh, the, the risk and the costs. Um, but certainly as we see the type of weather we're seeing and the widespread weather events, uh, which certainly impact the, the, the availability of imports and, and what we're seeing in uh, in, in other uh, other neighboring balancing authorities uh, in terms of their resource makeup, I think this certainly needs a relook. Thank you, Mr. Scala. Um, back to you, Chairman Gore. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, leave uh, some time for my colleagues to, to ask questions as well. So I may come back at the end, but I'm going to move on to uh, Commissioner Danley, see if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any questions. Thank you to the panelists. Okay, Commissioner Clements. Thanks, Chairman Glick. I do have one question. Um, Ms. Jackson and also Mr. White and Mr. Lawson talked about the transmission planning and the role of transmission related to resource adequacy. So I'm curious if um, you have any recommendations about how across the West we think about taking advantage of um, the opportunity to increase coordination on transmission planning. And I, a second part, uh, if you're up for it, is um, you know thinking about. I think the opportunity that the West has is to think about resource adequacy and transmission planning and market design together. Um, and so I worry if we start to think about them as siloed efforts that we, we don't maximize efficiencies on the reliability and the cost savings front. I'm curious if you can speak to that. Thank you. Mr. White, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for that question, uh, Commissioner Clements. I, I completely agree that, um, uh, you know, when WAC looks at resource adequacy, I mean, certainly there's, you know, kind of a pipe and bubble approach with respect to kind of the transfer, transfer capability. But at the end of the day, 
Um, if you cannot move power to load, it doesn't matter how, how much energy is actually on the system. So that is actually absolutely critical. And that's, you know, kind of to my point earlier, that's why we believe that ultimately there needs to be more fulsome, coordinated look at resource adequacy that includes also the transmission component and also some more of the reliability aspects with respect to contingency analysis, et cetera. So certainly, um, yeah, I think, I think a discussion of resource adequacy without that issue of, of transmission and, and the capacity to move it is, is, is really not going to be fruitful. So I think that's a great point. Thank you, Mr. White. Ms. Jackson, please go ahead. No, I think it's an excellent question. You make a, a very valuable point, which uh, operating these in silos is not the best way of going forward. You know, the pieces of the puzzle with looking at RTOs is when they see a nail, it's a solution that it comes with a hammer. hammer um, and so figuring out how to be better generation planning with the transmission planning and then looking at resource adequacy across the West where you can share some of those resources uh, is going to be essential. However, the caution that I think we all saw with last summer is the widespread weather events um, that cause higher levels of concern and higher planning needs. Um, so it's not enough to sit there and say the heat isn't going to extend from California to Colorado and up to the Pacific Northwest, while well, at the same time APS is feeling the same thing, we have to look at what is that going to look like for the system as a whole and what are we going to do about it. Um, so many different layers and complexities that we have to look at here. I do believe transmission is a key element um, as we consider and look at these. I do believe conversations have been initiated uh, through various groups that we have in the West on looking at how can we do a better job of interconnecting the various parts of the system and what does the coordinated function look like long term. Um, and I go back to, you know, the, I believe it was one of the previous panelists that was talking about how governance is going to play a big part of this uh, and how do we set that up. Um, there are many complexities that we are going to have to work our way through as we find solutions. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Carrington, please go ahead. So I, I can describe briefly what we're doing in the design of the resource adequacy uh, program. I think Jacob did a good job at uh, identifying the need to not only have firm energy and firm capacity, but you also need to back that up with firm transmission. So as part of our design in the forward showing program, uh, we're asking people to come to the table with a certain amount of their compliance obligation backed by firm transmission. Uh, and then on the evaluations, we're taking a look at known uh, transmission constraints. Uh, we so far have broken the Western um, footprint down into seven zones of known transmission constraints. It could turn out that if you're within a zone that doesn't have ample transmission, you need, you're going to need, need to either firm up the transmission across that constraint, or you're going to have to have resources within that zone to serve your own load. So there's, there's a bunch of things that we're considering, and I think they're all really good points, and they do need to be considered. And we know that energy can't flow easily from Canada, for example, to Nevada, and we have to work that out. Thank you, Mr. Carrington. Mr. Lawson, please go ahead. Yes, thanks for the question com and comments, Commissioner. It's absolutely important that these are not uh, looked at in silos. Um, if we want to leverage the resources across the West, uh, we have to deal with the seams issues. We have to develop common standards of understanding in order to maximize the existing transmission system. I, I don't want it to sound easy, but I will say it's easier to deal with resources than it is with transmission. Um, just try to site a new and build a new transmission line. Um, it's, it's a very long-term process. And um, as, as uh, Mr. Carrington mentioned, it's an an integrated part of how we have to look at resource adequacy. Um, thanks for making the point. Um, I hear it all the time. We can't think of resources without transmission. The, the two go hand in hand. And if we want a reliable system, we're going to need both. Thank you, Mr. Lawson. Back to you, Commissioner Clements. That's all for me. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Christie. Thank you to all the speakers. Very interesting presentations, and I have no questions. Thank you. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, thank you, Commissioner Christie. I, I do have uh, another question. I wanted to direct it towards Commissioner White, uh, if I can. Um, in terms of, I'm just curious about what you think. 
FERC's role should be in all of this. So, for instance, you I know in your testimony you talked about the need for consistency and what can certainly help in terms of consistency and modeling, consistency and assumptions and so on, and it can certainly help, I think, as, as act as a clearinghouse. But I wonder if you think there should be, you should have more, a, a greater role. Should we, um, through the NERC process, um, uh, provide greater, uh, an opportunity for standards, for additional standards? And do you think WAC is the right uh, organization to, uh, to pursue that? Oh, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for the question, uh, Chairman. I mean, I mean, certainly, you know, NERC right now with their um, Energy Reliability Assessment Task Force is looking at, um, uh, you know, um, from more from a fuel assurance standpoint and, and in terms of um, adequacy. I, I do think there's probably more of a role. I mean, the, the Western United States is, is much different, obviously, from the East, and that we don't have a centralized conductor uh, for this process. I think that's what we're really lacking. And certainly, if there was a RTO or whether it was more an expansion of the, the power pools program they're discussing, that would necessarily satisfy that. But I think what we're looking right now is just, um, as you mentioned earlier, or maybe it was um, Commissioner Clements, there is an urgency right now. And what we're seeing with respect to the work we've done with the, the Western assessment is that it, it really addresses that kind of one to four year time frame where we're doing a reliability check. But the truth is, as everyone mentioned, when you're talking about large CapEx um, uh, projects to address resource adequacy, at that point, the, the instruments to address resource adequacy, adequacy are probably too blunt. Um, and so really what we're looking for, and I think as part of the discussions going around the West is just again, more of a unified approach um, in how we're, we're thinking up all of these timeframes, assessments, metrics, et cetera, because it, but what we need um, beyond, you know, actually the operational um, role, which WEC probably wouldn't have a role in um, or doing anything that would have to do with the registered entity, but we do certainly need something for a common foundational tool to make those decisions, um, whether that looks like a, a um, you know, a, um, a resource adequacy, um, you know, standard, um, that's probably a discussion that I think would be best left to the, the utilities and the folks who actually participate in the standards making process. And I would kind of maybe caution for a one size fits approach to that, but certainly that's something that I think is being discussed at all levels. Um, and I, I do think that ultimately at the end of the day um, th that um, there needs to be some kind of centralized role. And I think WEC is probably because of our independence or our WAC wide view is probably the, probably the right partner for that um, with, with joining with all the stakeholders and many of them are on the panel today. So thank you for the question. Apologize, I was muted. I was asking if anyone had any, any anybody else wanted to comment on that. Uh, doesn't look like anyone's hands up, so I'm, I'll I'll just just ask. Oh, excuse me, uh, Chairman. I think Mr. Mr. Carrington raised his hand. Oh, I apologize, Mr. Carrington. Um, you know, as far as um, the standards, one of the things that is needed in the West, and I think um, Mr. White referred to this, in order to implement a resource adequacy program, we really need to have that uh, grid operator, program operator. So. In order to unlock the diversity, you do have to have somebody that has the visibility across the grid. So if you look at all of the other regions, you'll notice that most of them are being um, implemented through somebody like a Southwest Power Pool or a Cal ISO. So the one thing that we're missing is, is that program operator. And one of the things that we will be doing on the Northwest Power Pool is we will be standing up a program operator to be able to implement the resource adequacy. So that's kind of one of the linchpins that we have to think about in the West. Thank you. Um, being if, if no one else is, uh, wants to answer that question, I do have one other, one last question, if that's okay. Um, and this, Mr. Carrington, actually, I should address it to you. So uh, very interesting, uh, discussion about the Northwest Power Pool proposal, and uh, uh, I appreciate you uh, having a, a meeting with our office to talk about it as well. Um, I'm interested in, in imports and exports. Everyone mentioned exports or imports, and those are clearly uh, one of the mechanisms folks have been using to uh, to, to maintain um, reliability, especially during extreme weather conditions, for instance, or high, high levels of demand. Um, I'm curious in terms of the Northwest Power Pool proposal, when situation the situation is tight, what's the ability 
of others, for instance, in the Southwest to import power from the Northwest? Are there, are there going to be restrictions associated with exports, associated with the Northwest Power Pool proposal? So um, our footprint goes down to Nevada and Colorado and so forth. So we, we have the ability to help the desert Southwest and vice versa. You know, depending, and, and, but there are constraints on the system that I mentioned. We have seven known transmission zones that we're evaluating. I think the, the issue associated with imports is really interesting because we did do a fairly thorough analysis of imports coming into our region. And, you know, if you take a look at the average imports over the last 10 years, it's completely different than the imports that have occurred over the last two years. So we have to be really, really careful about how much we're relying on the imports. The program itself is being designed so that somebody outside of the Northwest Power Pool footprint can join, number one. Uh, number two, if they have resources outside of the Northwest Power Pool footprint, they can submit um, capacity products into our footprint. They would have to go through a certification process just like everybody within the footprint. Thank you. Naveem, I, I, uh, unless anyone else has any response to that question, um, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Chairman Glick. Um, if none of the other commissioners has a question, um, I will turn it over to my fellow staff moderator, Bob Helrick Dawson, for a couple of questions for the panelists. Bob, please go ahead. Thank you, Naveen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you well. Great. Um, uh, thanks to all the panelists today. I had a couple of questions, actually. I think we won't have time for all of them, actually. But uh, a couple of people mentioned using the 1 in 10 loss of load events standard. And I wondered if anybody wanted to comment on whether not the 1 in 10 portion of it, but the LOLE portion of it is the right thing to use versus, say, a 1 day in 10 years or 2.4 hours loss of load hours or uh, uh, expected unserved energy standard or some other standard might be the right metric to use. Uh, Mr. Carrington, so, you got um, so as part of our evaluation, we did take a look at all of the reliability regions in the U.S. We looked at Europe and we looked at Australia. Uh, the loss of load of uh, the one in 10 years seems to be a common factor across all of the reliability regions. There's a few that are, are different than that. Um, you know, the, the main thing is, is that you need to start somewhere. You need to establish a standard and then you need to go and look and you need to also assess whether or not there is a need to go beyond that because as you become more and more stringent, it, you, you become over compliant and then your costs go up as well. So there's a, a balance point between what the regulations and what the standards are going to be versus whether or not you don't want to lose load at all. And then you start to get into an exponential cost factor. So I, I think we, we need to be careful uh, because I think there is an expectation that nobody's lights go out at any time, especially it's horrific during COVID and everybody's at home depending on their you know, their electricity to be there. So, but we have to be careful. We have to do that balancing act between, you know, what's reasonable and what's not re reasonable. But, you know, if you take a look at the Southwest Power Pool and what happened this winter, uh, you know, they, they were within the design parameters of what they expected for their area, yet they ended up losing load and people weren't happy. So we have to think about that. We have to look at customer conditions as well. And Ms. Jackson, you've got your hand up too, thanks. Yeah, just really briefly, you know, one of the pieces of that comes to mind here in our planning processes is that you don't look at these uh, various components in isolation. Um, and there's something else that we look at as well, especially since um, starting in 2023 in Colorado with the retirement of one of our uh, plants, um, we will have to rely on variable energy resources to be present on our system to meet our peak load during the summer times. Uh, and so that's something we look at, but that means that we're also looking at what we call, well, everybody calls load duration curves. And then we look at the load duration curve and we layer over on top of that, um, you know, the ELCC to look at, okay, which hours of that could you cut off with 
storage versus which what happens to that net load duration curve, which is the load on the system net of any uh, on-site renewables um, or any renewables on the system, period, and what's left beyond that. And what we see is that once again, you know, the resources as you add more and more of the same type of generation, particularly on the variable energy resource side, there's that law of diminishing returns as you add the next resource. So you can't just look at one thing in isolation and say that it's it. You have to look at the different pieces of the puzzle. And we're going to have to do that more and more frequently as we see beneficial electrification and the transition of electrification, whether it's transportation or buildings, um, because our peaks are going to shift. And like on our curve that you saw on the ELCC, the reason that wind and solar switch places is because once you get to the winter time being more of a peaking resource, that peak in the winter comes in the early morning hours before the solar is on the system. So then it can't meet um, the needs of the capacity on the system. So these things are going to be very dynamic. You can't rubber stamp what we're bringing to you today as far as the models and say, this is how it's always going to be. We will continuously have to look at these evaluations. And just like we move from doing it a one hour a year peak look and now we're doing 8,760. Those are going to be the same complications we're going to be facing as we move through time through electrification and how these things cross um, and impact each other. Thanks, that's really helpful. Uh, Mr. Lawson. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting about modeling um, and it's always one of those things that the importance of modeling is always found in the fine print um you, you know it's one of those things what are the assumptions that you're making um and and a piece of this i, I would absolutely agree with uh, ms jackson it, it's not done in isolation uh, you might be looking at a probabilistic model that doesn't tell you how wide or how deep your issue might be um, and how you might solve it um, i think it's also important uh, i think mr carrington touched on it and that's that we can't rely on history only um, what goes forward is probably going to be different than what our history tells us. And if we rely too much on what's happened in the last two decades to look forward, we're going to miss something. And so I think that's incorporated in the models. I think it's, it's not done in isolation. It's one piece of the puzzle. And it points out something that I think we all struggle with, um, especially when we're talking to the public. And that's that these issues really don't fit very well on a bumper sticker. Um, they're, they're really complex and um, there's a lot of assumptions that go into it. And so people will tend to jump in and, and pick out the message that they want to pick out and they will run with it and they'll, they'll go to whoever they think is a decision maker with that. And so um, your question is very timely. It's, it's a piece to the puzzle and we have to pay attention to the fine print. All right, thanks. That's very helpful too. Uh, Mr. Tetlow, I think your hand's up too. And yeah. we'll, uh, I'm going to try to cut off this particular question after you. Yeah, that. sure. I, I just wanted to comment. I, I agree. You can't take it in isolation. I think it's a it's a standard. It is what it is. It's the other components and variables. And, and that, you know, the effective load carrying capacity of renewables and energy storage, that and how you analyze it will have a significant impact on how we then address that loss of load probability function. Yeah, you know, I, I think about the example I quoted 25%, you know, of effective nameplate. And, and much to kind of Alice's point, our peak has already shifted out a couple of hours. I mean, we used to be a four o'clock peaking utility. We're now a six o'clock peaking utility. So I said 25%, but the reality is that 25% is going to be a lower number as we move to 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. And then if you layer in the fact that, well, if you put in, you know, utility scale, single axis tracking solar, you can get a 60% contribution to nameplate over peak if you're using a 6 p.m. peak. So that's a very dynamic set of variables that, you know, you have to layer those in as you're looking at. That's why I worry about just 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 looking at loss of load probability because it's all the other factors layered, layered on that makes the difference. And, and just if I might tie this back to real quick, uh, Commissioner Glick's point earlier about standards. I think, Bob, your question was, okay, you've got one in 10, but then what is the event uh, that is one in 10 you're preventing against? And I, I agree, there is a wide variety, variability, in between, and you know, one in 10, is it a one hour event or is it a 24 hour event? And it sounds like uh, Arizona may have switched recently after looking at that question. I think that that's probably something worth standardizing to the extent possible, or at least make sure we're all talking about the same, same event when we're comparing uh, different models or different, different standards. 
Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, Naveen, I see we're, we've got about one minute left. Why don't I go ahead and I'll cut myself off here and let you take over. Thank you very much, Bob, and thank you to all the panelists and the commissioners for contributing to this panel. We are coming up on 2.15, which is when we are scheduled to transition to take a break between the first and the second panels. So uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. We will end the first panel now and take a 15-minute break to reconvene at 2.30 for the beginning of panel two. Um, panelists on panel one, please uh, sign out and exit the WebEx meeting so that we make space for the second panel speakers to log on. If you would like to continue watching the conference, you may use the public webcast link on the conference event page at FERC.gov. Um, Mr. Chairman and commissioners who are able to stay online, please do stay online till this time as we will use the same meeting for the second panel. Pan pan panelists for panel two, please be online in five minutes around uh, between now and 2.20. We'll run through the technical logistics to make sure everyone has been able to connect. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we will go on break and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Right, everybody, um, if you are ready, please turn your video camera on and be ready for us to go live. Hello again and welcome back to the conference for the afternoon session of day one of the, of the Technical Conference on Resource Adequacy in the Western Future Connection. My name is Naveen Shaker, and I am from the Commission's Office of Energy Market Regulation. For those of you who are tuning in for the first time today, I want to cover some logistics for the conference. This conference is being webcast live via Capital Connection and being transcribed, and it will also be recorded for future viewing. We don't intend to discuss specific details or merits of any pending contested proceedings before the Commission, and we ask that all participants uh, refrain from such discussion. If any such matters involve details of uh, pending proceedings, my colleague Colin Beckman from the Office of General Counsel might interject to ask the speaker to avoid that topic. With those reminders out of the way, let's get started with the second panel entitled Trends and Regional Challenges in Resource Adequacy. Each, per each panelist will introduce themselves and give initial opening remarks of no longer than Four minutes. After that, we will begin a question and answer session with the commissioners and staff. Let's get started. First, we have Carrie Bentley, who is the CEO of Gridwell Consulting. Ms. Bentley, please go ahead with your remarks. Sorry about that. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the commissioners for hosting a technical conference on such an important issue. I'm Carrie Bentley, CEO of Gridwell Consulting. I designed the California ISO's existing RA backstop process, and today as a consultant, I help both load and supply clients across the West with their RA strategy and contracting. So it's from this perspective that I'd like to offer three RA trends. The first trend we heard a lot about in the first panel already, and that's a desire for regional coordination. While there's a long history of coordinated efforts across the West, the desire for effective coordination has never been more sincere. This aspiration comes from an urgent need to ensure that there's sufficient capacity across all Western loads. I would say while the California ISO is the most visible entity that relies on RA imports and even market imports to keep the lights on, many balancing areas rely on or support transfers vital to reliability. Under these tight capacity conditions across the West, RA coordination is both needed and wanted. The second trend I'd like to highlight is the increased need for transparency. All Western load responsible entities, and especially the California ISO, should make data related to demand forecasts and existing and planned resources as transparent as possible. I think data should meet a AAA requirement that means available, accurate, and accessible. 
Um, I think available and accurate are pretty self-explanatory, but by accessible, I mean able to be understood by an industry professional. If I can't understand your data set, um, and I, my whole career is an RA, then it's not accessible. I think commissioners, uh, the commissioners would be surprised by the lack of data transparency at the California ISO, um, and even to some extent the CPUC related to the RA program. Um, something as basic as California's system RA requirement or monthly RA volumes are not routinely made public. Um, neither is the reliability run demand forecast. These are important data sets for planning and their lack of availability makes planning and investment decisions very challenging. Um, other data that actually is available frequently lacks accessibility. Um, we saw this um, happening on our planning standards for the last August events. Um, data sets were misunderstood and then they were misused in the state's planning processes. Maybe one can argue that transparency didn't matter as much when we had more than enough capacity, but this is no longer true. And I think increased transparency is vital to Western reliability. Finally, I'd like to highlight the increase in uncertainty in RA planning. Um, this was talked a lot about as well in the last panel. Um, the increase in demand and supply uncertainty is posing significant challenges for the region. Um, a significant change on the demand side is that climate change has disrupted the accuracy of demand forecasting. So I'm not a forecasting expert, but it seems to me that forecasters are still pretty good at modeling climate change impacts on the magnitude of demand. That is, they could still answer how high during a reliability event, but where they struggle with, I think, is the how often. Um, if a one in two planning standard is more is accurate most of the time, but the one in 10 forecast happens you know, every couple of years, it's still a helpful forecast because it's accurately predicting the demand during a weather event, but it's not predicting a one in 10 year event. So in some ways, I think our terminology is holding us back and addressing forecasting uncertainty. And I think this is well illustrated by the comments in the last panel. Um, and I think they really clearly articulated that we need a more nuanced way to talk about demand in the context of climate change. Um, uncertainty on the supply side, I think is well documented. Increased renewables and storage, drought conditions impacting hydro availability, new technologies being integrated into the grid. These all add complications and uncertainty to short and long-term planning. You know, the West grid is really going through a transformation and I know uncertainty is only one of these challenges, but I believe that pushing toward more transparency, pushing toward more coordination are certainly the first steps toward a more reliable grid. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bentley, for those remarks. After, after you next, we have Mr. Bryce Freeman, Administrator of the Wyoming Office of the Consumer Advocate. Please go ahead, Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Naveen. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bryce Freeman. Uh, I am the Administrator of the Wyoming Office of Consumer Advocate. And uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank the Commission and its staff and uh, for inviting me to be part of this very important discussion that we're having today. I've been in the utility regulatory world for almost 30 years, and in my experience, there is really no more important or pressing issue than that of resource adequacy as it relates to the bulk power system, particularly in the Western interconnection. Uh, I will address the questions posed by the quest, uh, Commission in its notice of this hearing momentarily. But first, I would offer my perspective as a consumer advocate uh, in order to set the context for the remainder of my remarks. Uh, be before I do that, however, I am obligated to provide the standard disclaimer uh, that the remarks I make today are mine alone and do not necessarily reflect the position of the state of Wyoming or any other office or agency within the state. I'm simply offering the perspectives of a consumer advocate. Safety, reliability, and affordability are the three legs of the consumer stool. Without any one of those legs, the stool is useless in the provision of retail electric service. And in that sense, they are all equally important to customers. The cheapest service in the world is of little use to customers 
if it doesn't work when needed. And conversely, service that is 100% safe and reliable is no good if customers can't afford to buy it. Between those two extremes is the sweet spot for cus customers. Orders issued by the Public Service Commission in Wyoming often reference the fact that utility service, among other things, must be adequate. Utilities have the burden to prove that their service is adequate. It used to be a lot easier to do that. In the old days, utilities simply needed to show that they had adequate, what in those days was mostly owned, generation capacity to serve a reasonable estimate of load and maintain a fixed reserve margin. Over the last 20 years, this calculus has changed dramatically with the expansion of wholesale capacity and energy trading and the exponential growth of intermittent resources and corresponding decline of base, base load dispatchable resources. Bearing the burden of proof that a utility system is resource sufficient is no longer a simple exercise in arithmetic. A greater reliance on market purchases and energy provided by non-dispatchable resources makes this resource adequacy assessment a much more qualitative than quantitative endeavor than it has been in the past. Recent events in the West and elsewhere bear this out. On paper, California looked to be resource adequate last summer, if only barely, when a record heat wave permeated the western United States, resulting in rotating outages. Likewise, Texas didn't go into the month of February this year knowing it was resource deficient. Similar events are almost guaranteed to recur in the future unless we collectively put more effort into defining resource adequacy and quantifying the resources necessary to meet that definition. So what can we do, do to help us meet the goal of ensuring the bulk electric system is adequately resourced? Well, I think we need to first slow down, take a deep breath, and put analytical pen to paper. Continuing our headlong rush to decarbonization without a better understanding of its implications for reliability has, uh, can, could have a, a dramatic impact and is inadvisable, in my opinion. We can't retire all of our dispatchable baseload generation until we know that we have alternative technologies that are equally reliable and affordable. Much of our resource adequacy planning is based on production cost modeling in the West, which in turn is based on myriad assumptions regarding uh, generation profiles, estimated capacity factors, and the like. Production cost modeling on its own, however, is in insufficient to produce robust resource adequacy assessments. The type and location of new generation resources or storage resources is equally important in assessing resource adequacy, especially in the West, which is characterized by long, skinny, and loosely interconnected transmission paths. We can only ascertain this important element of resource adequacy through power flow modeling. And finally, we need to have a pretty good idea I think, of what all of this is going to cost before we build it, since at the end of the day, it is the customers at the end of the line who will be expected to pay the freight. We need to engage in a more robust planning exercise, one that includes substantially more quantified results. The past practice of gluing individual utility IRPs together in a patchwork fashion is no longer sufficient. Instead, we must undertake a holistic assessment of generation and transmission adequacy that extends from the various western subregions throughout the entire western interconnection, one that encompasses not only the adequacy of capacity, but the adequacy of the transmission system to interconnect 
new generation and storage resources and deliver those resources to load while planning for the retirement of existing resources. Such an assessment will necessarily be based on probabilistic reserve metrics such as loss of load probabilities, effective load carrying capability, and others to complement the static metrics that we've always used like the standard one in 10 year event metric. And reserve margins will need to be dynamic as more intermittent resources are integrated into the system and energy use demand patterns shift due to increasing electrification of buildings and transportation in some sub areas of the West. Planning for volatile hydro conditions will also be important, although somewhat less so in certain subregions. Much of the future new generation will be third party owned and may or may not be subject to long term power purchase agreements. As wholesale capacity and energy trading continue to grow, we need to take care to ensure that the same megawatt or megawatt hour is not being relied upon by multiple load serving entities to serve load. That will require a much greater degree of interregional coordination than we have presently. The current initiative by the Northwest Power Pool that Mr. Carrington talked about in the last panel uh, is a good first step in the right direction, but it will not ultimately be sufficient by itself. And lastly, governance will be important. Efforts to reform and advance markets in the West will fail if they are not comprehensive, independent, and inclusive of all interested stakeholders. If the end goal is a West-wide RTO, that organization will have to be one that solicits the engagement of all regulators and all stakeholders in the West, including a prominent role for consumer advocates. In my opinion, states in the West will never consent to utilities under their jurisdiction joining an RTO that is governed by the laws of one state or dominated by the interests of utilities. Transmission planning and cost allocation are far too important for individual states to cede control of those functions to an organization that is not truly independent and regional in nature and free from utility bias. And that concludes my opening remarks. I'll give it back to you, Naveen. Thank you very much for those detailed remarks, Mr. Freeman. We appreciate it. Next up, we have Ms. Elaine Hart, who is Principal of Moment Energy Insights LLC and Great Club Expert. Ms. Hart, please go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Glick, uh, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Elaine Hart, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I'll spend these opening comments providing just a little bit of context for the lens that I'll be bringing to the conversation today. Uh, I'm currently an independent consultant based in Portland, Oregon, and I'm co-leading an effort to develop an open source resource adequacy model for the Western United States. This work is funded by GridLab, and my co-lead is Anna Maleva of Blue Marble Analytics. Our work is focused on innovating in a few of the areas that are critical for understanding resource adequacy, not only today, but in a future with a greater reliance on clean technologies. And in the first phase of this work, we're really focused on understanding the challenges that are posed by critical weather conditions as they're experienced across the West, as well as the impact of regional coordination on the nature of the RA challenge. We're also seeking to offer improved transparency in RA analysis by relying on publicly available data sets and leveraging open source software in this effort. So many of the comments that I'll offer today uh, are grounded in this ongoing work. Uh, prior to this effort, however, uh, I led integrated resource planning at Portland General Electric, uh, where we were able to develop some fairly sophisticated approaches to thinking about resource adequacy. Uh, but we faced the challenge of planning for RA as a relatively small entity within this much larger uh, interconnected system. And we did so without explicit coordination with our neighbors. And so some of the comments that um, I'll be sharing today are also based in that experience. At a, at a high level, what we're finding with our West-wide work corroborates my experience at the utility, which is that the interconnectedness of the West is a key driver of resource adequacy for individual utilities and for planning entities. And what I mean by that is that if you only look at a particular part of the West in isolation, your findings with respect to RA are often strongly driven by the assumptions that you make about how you're interacting with your neighbors when the grid is constrained. 
Whether you even identify that you have an RA problem could solely depend on those assumptions. Now, many entities in the West plan for some amount of reliance on broader Western markets, even during constrained periods. Uh, but these assumptions can vary widely, and there's been no effort um, to enforce any sort of internal consistency across those assumptions. Uh, as a result of that, we can't actually determine whether the region as a whole will be adequate or inadequate just by stacking up all the various studies out there. This is a point that's already been made by the first two panelists. Uh, and, and that's a problem just in terms of understanding where we're starting from. Uh, looking forward, though, we also know that the system is becoming more constrained, uh, more uncertain, and more dynamic as we integrate more renewables and storage, and as we retire more thermal plants. This is a necessary stage in the evolution uh, toward a cleaner grid, but ensuring RA in this new paradigm uh, is quite a bit more complicated. And ensuring it in an efficient manner especially is complicated. Uh, it's going to require a much more sophisticated and coherent understanding of the system than we have today. Uh, and, and this coherence, it's, it's challenging in the West. You know, we have uh, a great diversity of resources, climates, loads, um, you know, across the various corners of, of the West, but we also have a lot of diversity in the way we like to do things. Uh, and so achieving this type of coordination and coherence across resource ad adequacy methodologies is going to be challenging. But, you know, I think that that diversity can also be our strength as a broader region if we're able to, to leverage it by working together. Uh, the work that we're doing with Red Lab is intended to support that type of coordination by offering rigorous analytics and greater transparency into the regional dynamics that are at play when the grid is most constrained. Uh, I suspect that the discussion today will also serve to improve transparency and to illuminate maybe some of the higher level regional dynamics that are at play. And so I'm excited for the dialogue today uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to participate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hart. Next up, we have Commissioner Sivakunda, Commissioner at the California Energy Commission. We're ready to hear you, Mr. Gunda. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Naveen. Um, good afternoon, Chair Glick um, and Commissioners. Thanks to you and FERC staff for your leadership and for facilitating this important conversation. I'm grateful to be here uh, and to share and learn from this conversation, um, as, as the number of the uh, fellow panelists already noted. Uh, for the record, I'm Siva Gunda, I'm newly appointed to the Commission, uh, the California Energy Commission in February. The California Energy Commission is the state's premier energy planning and policy agency with key roles in forecasting, resource planning assessments, setting building and appliance standards, uh, siting and compliance of thermal fleet, compliance of uh, compliance tracking of RPS, and funding R&D and incentives in all sectors making up uh, California's economy. As it pertains to resource adequacy and, and the dialogue today, <clears throat> CEC has the role of developing the assessments that form the foundational set of common planning assumptions, such as the year ahead forecasts um, that uh, my fellow uh, panelist, uh, Ms. Bentley mentioned earlier. The forecasts uh, are then used by CPUC and CAISO for setting out requirements, integrated resource planning, as well as transmission planning. Um, at a high level, I would like to share a few observations, both in the near term uh, as well as the long term, to set uh, the conversation. Number one, uh, lessons learned from the joint agency uh, root cause analysis uh, following the load shed events last year. One, the key point uh, for this conversation um, is climate change impacts and the increased extreme weather events, and how do we best account for these in our planning? Uh, this was raised by uh, Ms. Bentley. Uh, while CEC develops a library of forecasts under different weather conditions, uh, we as a state uh, have the, the need and the necessity to coordinate and develop a consensus on how best to capture this in our resource planning. Uh, planning for the net peak period and potentially other periods of stress, uh, as um, panelists noted, the, the dynamic nature of the grid as it moves forward, um, as our demands and resource mix continues to evolve, is an important element. Uh, the intermittent resources uh, are, are rapidly accelerating on the grid. For example, the PV uh, is today almost 20 gigs uh, in, 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 in California, uh, 10 in front of the meter and 10 behind the meter. And that has happened very rapidly. Second, key takeaways from SB100 Joint Agency Report. The SB100 um, uh, bill basically calls for the state to uh, develop an assessment and a report to understand the opportunity uh, to get to 100% um, retail sales in California being met by zero carbon resources by 2045 
and this was jointly conducted by uh, CPUC, CEC, and California Air Resources Board in consultation with the balancing authorities. So some kind of the key findings there uh, are that we're going to continue to add new renewables uh, to the system to meet our SB100 goals. By 2045, we are looking at potentially tripling our electric grid capacity needs in California. Diversity of resource technologies, as well as the geography, are highly valued uh, in the analysis. And finally, um, this will require us to continue to adapt our resource adequacy framework to ensure energy sufficiency and capacity at all hours of the day, as well as all days of the year. Third, anticipated acceleration of building and, and transportation electrification. We expect to see significant increases in demand, as well as load shapes uh, due to building and, and transportation electrification, both in the near term as well as in the long term which are critical to meeting our statewide decarbonization goals. This will lead to increase in demand, but also opportunities for demand flexibility. For example, uh, based on the governor's executive order of um, you know, no more ICE, in, ICE vehicles in 2035, we're look, looking at approximately 8 million electric vehicles in 2030 in this state. So we may also become a double peaking, uh, where we must plan for both our historical summer peak but also the winter peaks due to more electrified building stock in the state. Four, I would like to raise a few opportunities and uncertainties in the resource mix. Um, one of the uh, points that uh, Elaine already raised, um, there are a few areas that the CEC, these are some of the few areas that the CEC, CPUC, and CAISO all recognize as key opportunities and uncertainties as we plan for resource adequacy and grid reliability, both in the short and the long term. We're spending a lot of time coordinating, uh, and as others noted, uh, the coordination uh, has been at the historic high. Uh, we're working together very closely, but there's much to be done. Some of those resources are demand response and, and load flexibility. Uh, demand response programs are an important resource that can provide valuable grid support. However, changes need to be made to increase participation in these programs, and that's something we're really closely looking at. Imports. Um, as California has historically relied on imports to meet its resource adequacy needs, um, especially during the net peak time periods, as ca capacity becomes tighter throughout the West and we see more and more West uh, extreme heat waves, it becomes less certain how much we can rely on imports during stress conditions, and this is something we need to really understand and plan for. And finally, effects of drought. This has been raised. Drought creates uncertainty in the availability of the hydro capacity, while for this year, we anticipate the hydro capacity to be able to serve our peak loads. The overall energy uh, participation of the hydro fleet continues to decrease in drought conditions, and that is something we need to very closely observe. Um, and finally, in closing, uh, Commissioner Clements raised the important issue of taking a comprehensive look at RA and reliability planning this morning. For the long-term planning, uh, we launched an SB100 statewide implementation work last, last month to ensure adequate coordination between all agencies as well as important stakeholders for long-term planning, reliability, affordability, but also equity, which make up key pillars for our continued work on SB100. We just kicked this off at uh, the workshop and then happy to um, add some of the uh, points as we move forward. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm grateful to be here. Thanks. Thank you very much for those pertinent remarks, Commissioner Gunda. Now we will have Mr. Mark Holman next, who is Managing Director of PowerX. Please go ahead, Mr. Holman. Thank you, Naveed. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Holman. I'm a managing director of PowerUps Corp, the merchant subsidiary of British Columbia Hydro. I want to thank the commission and the commission staff for the opportunity to participate today. I want to begin by saying that I think we all recognize in the West that the decarbonization of the Western grid has now reached a critical point where we need to focus our attention on resource adequacy. In order to add to the conversation today, my opening remarks are going to touch on three very specific areas where resource adequacy gaps have become apparent and can be expected to grow if our focus becomes limited to ensuring the resource adequacy of Western utilities only. These are OAT energy imbalance tariff services, retail access programs, which are relatively small but growing, and California's import resource adequacy framework. In each of these three areas, it is the absence of either a clear capacity requirement or alternatively, sufficient incentives to procure enough capacity that creates this gap. In each circumstance, there is a clear disconnect 
between the entity that enjoys the savings associated with under procuring capacity and the entity or entities and its ratepayers that ultimately bear the reliability and economic consequences of that decision. Achieving resource adequacy throughout the West will ultimately require that each of these three capacity free riding opportunities be addressed. I note that each of these three gaps has existed for many years. However, unlike the past, when the Western grid as a whole was often flush with capacity, both the incentives and the consequences of this capacity leaning activity are far greater today. For example, in the Western region outside of California, third party loads and generators have strong incentives today to lean on the capacity of the incumbent utility through the use of its energy imbalance tariff services. Now, it is my understanding that these tariff services were never designed or intended for this purpose. That is to enable a third party to shore up its capacity inadequacy in those hours that they can't find spot market energy supply to meet their obligations. Rather, it is my understanding that these services were intended to help third parties manage moment to moment variations in their load and their generation resources due to physical phenomena, not the decision to forego having enough capacity in the first place. But this appears to be precisely what we see happening now throughout the West, namely a third party load or generator rationally go short on capacity, enjoy sizable savings, and then other customers in the applicable service territory bear the resulting reliability risk and or end up funding additional backstop capacity as there is generally no mechanism to pass these backstop capacity costs through. Similarly, retail access programs in the Western grid are intended to provide consumers with retail choice, but presumably always in a manner that is supportive of efficient and reliable wholesale market outcomes, but where no rules have been instituted to either require or sufficiently incent retail access providers to procure sufficient capacity to meet their own demand, then these programs can create the same capacity free riding or leaning opportunity and incentives. Finally, we see similar outcomes in California, where they actually have a formal resource adequacy framework. In particular, California's import resource adequacy rules do not require suppliers to identify any specific capacity resources. And it is often well understood that a supplier may be merely relying on its ability to purchase spot market energy to meet its resource adequacy delivery obligations as each day and hour arrives. If and when that supplier ultimately fails to deliver, it is the CAISO and all consumers throughout the CAISO footprint that may ultimately bear the consequences of that decision. At a high level, I believe there are only two general solutions to addressing these three gaps. Either entities must be required to bear the full financial consequences of their capacity under procurement, including the cost to consumers of firm load interruptions, or if that is not palatable, then well-defined capacity procurement requirements must be broadly adopted. Finally, I wanna say that I believe the Northwest Power Pool Resource Adequacy Program under development is a critical step in addressing these issues in the West, but I also believe that regulators must be vigilant in their support for the elimination of each of these gaps I talked about today if we are to be successful in ensuring reliability and affordable power across the Western grid as we continue on our decarbonization path. Thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Holman. Up next, we will have Mr. Paul Lau, who is the CEO and General Manager of the Sacramento Municipal Utility District in California. Mr. Lau will be referring to a map which we will display uh, during the course of his remarks. Mr. Lau, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Devin. Uh, Chair Glickman and Commissioners, uh, thank you for holding this important hearing. Uh, my name is Paul Lau, and I'm the CEO of SMUD, uh, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, and it's an honor to be here to be asked to represent SMUD on this panel today. And I'd like to briefly highlight some of the points from my written statement. Uh, first, I'll, I'll start a little bit about SMUD. Uh, SMUD is this, the nation's sixth largest community-owned not-for-profit utility. We serve around 1.5 million people in and around Sacramento. Our renewable energy goal has always been more aggressive than the state's goals, uh, and SMUD became the first large California utility to achieve our 20% RPS. And today, our power supply is about 50% carbon-free. 
Uh, just last month, we adopted a plan to completely eliminate all carbon emissions from our power supply by 2030. And this is the most aggressive goal of any large utility in the US. Now, in terms of resource adequacy, why SMUD is exempt from regulations by the California Public Utilities Commission, we have generally adopted resource adequacy standards and goals set by this California PUC. Uh, SMUD is one of the several Northern California municipal utilities that formed the Balancing Authority of Northern California, or known as Bank and Bank. And Bank is interconnected to both Kaiso and Bonneville. Now, it extends over 500 miles from south of Tracy, California, to the California Oregon border at Captain Jack, Oregon. Since 2019, a bank has served as an energy and balance market entity in Kaiso's Western EIM, a market that has grown to include a number of non Kaiso entities in the West. And Bank is also a member of the Northwest Power Pool Reserve Sharing Group, and we have been engaging in their resource adequacy program development. So, next, I'll turn to SMUT's role in organized market. Uh, SMUT has greatly benefited from participating in the Kaiso EIM. Uh, we support the expansion of organized market in the Western interconnections, such as EIM and the Kaiso's proposed extend day ahead market. Now, SMUD were the first public utility to participate in the Kaiso EIM and believe organized market expansion is critical to our decarbonization and reliability goals. Now, while SMUD supports this expansion, we believe organized market needs to develop organically, driven from bottom up. And we've seen great success with the development of EIM, and I encourage the commissioner to support continued organic market development. Now, next, I'll turn to some of the regional challenges facing SMUD and others in the West. Now, SMUD is a strong advocate for the advancement of regional markets, but there are obstacles. Last summer, heat wave events highlighted significant challenges to the sufficiency of capacity resources, inconsistent market rules, and possible deficiency in transmission infrastructure between adjacent balancing authorities. And my written testimony has more details. So I would just highlight a few things I think FERC could do to address these concerns. First, the Commission can help shape clear, transparent, and non-discriminatory market rules, and some of those in adopted before the Commission today. Now, second, while the Commission lacks direct authority to open carbon reduction, it can facilitate utilities meeting carbon reduction goals set by various states. Now, third, why it can only be triggered by request from the state's Public Utility Commission this commission has broad but historic underutilized authority under Section 207 of the Federal Power Act to remedy inadequate interstate service resulting from interregional barriers to power transfers and inadequate transmission infrastructure. Now, this may give the commission power not only to improve interregional transfer, but also address inadequate interstate transmission capacity. Now, I'll conclude by highlighting three other opportunities for federal assistance. First, collaboration between the White House and other federal agencies, including the Commission, I think is critical to advance grid modernization as a mean to improve interregional coordination of power markets. Second, SMUD would urge a more targeted Commission policy that better ensure transmission incentives result in transmission being built that would otherwise have not been developed and that the incentives are no more than what's needed to accomplish their purpose. Now, finally, I think the commission can help by doing less in one area by avoiding the use of mandatory centralized capacity market. And with that, I'll conclude my prepared remarks and I look forward to further discussions and answering any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that, Mr. Lau. We appreciate it. At this point, we'll go to our final panelist in panel two. Um, this will be Mr. Director of Supply and Fuels and Solar for Project in Arizona. Please go ahead, Mr. Olson. All right, good afternoon. Thank you very much. My name is Robert Olson, also known as Bob Bobby. I am the, the Director of Supply and Trading in Fuels for Salt River Project, uh, located, located here in Phoenix, Arizona. I uh, want to take a moment to thank the Commission and staff for the, for the opportunity to present here today and to discuss what we believe is a really important topic with respect to the West. SR SRP is a political subdivision of the, of the state and uh, is a public power entity that provides customers to more than one million power to more than one million customers here in the state of Arizona. 
And like many other utilities and utilities in the West, are focused on uh, decarbonizing our fleet in a responsible manner. Uh, our objectives by 2035 would help to reduce our carbon in, uh, in city by more than 65%. And that's that's including the uh, retirement of some large facilities. And we look at that, that, that kind of form basis for some of, the, some of the concerns that we have as we move, move forward. As uh, Mr. Toe in uh, the first uh, panel uh, referenced, Phoenix is actually one, one of the fastest growing areas in the country. Uh, what makes Phoenix attractive is what makes most of the West attractive and unique from, from a locational perspective. Uh, we have of uh, great weather most of the year. Uh, I know that when we look at hot weather, weather here in the set may not necessarily feel like that would be the case. The case, but it's a great place to go. Wide open spaces, and we think that that's going to create demand, continued uh, mobilization of, of folks to Arizona, and want to stay here. In addition to the, to that, we see some growth from manufacturing. Uh, our growth is really driven by uh, kind of a unique set of being being really a great place with with uh, less labor. labor and, um, um, and critical skill sets to grow. That being said, that, that's going to create additional challenges for SRP and other entities here in the desert southwest as we really work to decarbonize. It's, it's our plan here by the end of 2030 will end up replacing or supplementing nearly half of generation we have online today. And that, that creates a big challenge as we move forward. One of the broader trends we see that's a little, a little turning is utilities as they, they work to transition there there's always a, there's a timing aspect as to when you bring on new resources and it's that timing aspect that creates some um, ne necessary tendencies where we, we want to lean on or, or acquire short, short term capacity for meeting our re adequacy components and what we see is we see a, a trend as more and more utilities are fo focusing on urbanizing they're actually seeing, seeing uh, more and more market dependence for meeting some of those adequacy components that instead of historically been uh, helped to true up, true up some of the efficiency aspects that we see in day-to-day -day operations. Now, the concern really is that you can get concept where, where you have utilities that, that are, I define that they intend to purchase a market, but have no, no clear uh, aspect of where they're getting it from, from, from a resource FC perspective. I think that creates a lot of risk as you look at utilities that may be looking at the same, same resources or expect, expecting the same just to come through, through during very tight and constrained conditions. It's really important as we, as we look at uh, resource source adequacy moving forward, especially for regions uh, that become more import port dependent, such as the desert southwest, that we, we focus on deliverability of that capacity and energy, and not just simply accounting for it in our plan and identifying that it's out there. Out there, uh, Transmission access is something that uh, a lot of folks are aware of in terms of constraints within the West. We haven't seen significant transmission. Uh, others have others invest in the sense that, that lot planning, little construction with respect to, to transmission in the West. Uh, that can help to open up and up and act, uh, provide ac access for some of the, the uh, resource assay that we're looking at move forward. Uh, but the challenging concerns that I have specifically within my area where I'm responsible not just for adequacy, really how that turns in, turns in operation and ex execution of the adequacy plan and, and looking at sufficiency. It's really important that we marry, marry up an adequacy, adequacy plan that really is executable. That gets to, del to deliver a bit of energy, energy on uh, firm, reliable transmission. And that gets to kind of ensuring that you've got some of the su supporting um, fuel frameworks to kind of, to kind of help make uh, work, work. One of the things that we see is the challenges with long-term capacity planning and the way that some of the gas markets operate, as you, you see, um, it, you, you see greater dependency upon gas for help, helping to meet cha challenges in, West in terms of, in terms of post you know, of solar, solar. I think it's really important that we see alignment there. Okay. Finally, uh, I'll comment on the, on the concept. So, similar to what others said, we believe that markets can be an efficient way to help towards solving uh, both adequacy and reliability problems long term. But the, what makes the West unique is that we'll continue, continue to make incent incremental steps with respect to the West um, and, and incremental markets. We agree with the concept that as it moves forward, uh, there, there's an opportunity to optimize and help manage some of the sufficiency obligations. But that didn't relieve or absolve any of the adequacy obligations that everyone come to the table with respect to those mar markets really prepared and, and uh capable of meeting their own adequacy needs.
And with that, I'll conclude my prepared remarks and uh, turn it back over to, over to you, Naveen. Thank you very much for your comments, Mr. Olson. We did notice a little bit of echo and um, fee, uh, audio lag when we were speaking. We'll try to work with you to address that while we move to the discussion section. Thank you very much for your remarks. Um, that brings us to the end of all the panelists for panel two. We will now begin the question and answer session with commissioners and staff as we do this panel. As a reminder, if, ever, if a question is directed at a specific panelist, please unmute yourself and respond to the question. If a panelist would like to answer a general question posed by the commissioner or staff, please use the WebEx raise hand function to speak. And we will call on you sequentially as you raise your hand. Uh, please remember to unmute yourself and then when you are about to talk and then mute yourself when you have finished your comments and then lower your hand virtually. When you have completed your answer, um, we will make sure that um, uh, we will make sure that everybody has been called upon. I will now turn it over to Chairman Glick for the question and answer session. Chairman Glick, please go ahead. Thank you, Naveen. Um, appreciate it again. Thank you for uh, everybody for participating today. Um, I wanted to start by asking a question of all the panelists. Um, and that is, uh, you know, there was some discussion in the first panel and again on this panel about the need for consistency, both in terms of assumptions and metrics used in terms of resource adequacy uh, uh, targets and developing those targets. Um, I um, wonder, I'm wondering uh, if, if maybe some of you can elaborate on specific assumptions and metrics that, that there needs to be some consistency. And secondly, how we would go about doing that in the absence of a single RTO, for instance, is, are there, is there, who, who would be the best entity for ensuring that kind of consistency? Uh, Naveen, this is Bryce Freeman. Uh, if uh, nobody else has got their hand up, I couldn't manage to get my hand up fast enough, but uh that's a good question chairman glick uh you know i've i've been involved in uh transmission expansion planning and resource adequacy assessment uh activities at WEC for probably 15 years now and uh so there just is a general lack of uh everybody using the same uh, recipe book in the WEC on anything. Uh, we don't even have the, for example, WEC doesn't even have uh, the same, the uh, jurisdictional utilities that uh, report information, system information to WEC, uh, don't even report that information uh, using the same protocol. So when uh, the WEC staff gets the information and uh, goes to compile a data set, they oftentimes have to make some fairly heroic assumptions about uh, what that data actually means and, and how to make it consistent with data being reported uh, by other entities and uh, also uh, able to be useful in the modeling. So. I think we need to start all the way back there. For example, uh, there are, I don't know how many thousands of buses in the West. Uh, a lot of times uh, those buses are not reported by the jurisdictional entities uh, where they are. And so we don't even know uh, in, in some cases where the buses are when we go to compile a production cost modeling run. Uh, now that's not WEC's fault. I'm not casting dispersions on WEC. They do a fabulous job, in my opinion, of uh, producing assessments and uh, planning documents and, and so forth uh, with the information they have, and and frankly, I think that would be the logical place uh, for this to to happen. Would be WAC. Uh, they are independent. Uh, they're uh, well resourced. There's a bunch of smart people that work there, but 
they really don't have that charge right now to uh, look at uh, you, they don't have any inf enforcement or compliance authority with regard to resource adequacy so that would have to be something that would have to be addressed thank you very much mr. Freeman uh, mr. Holman please go ahead Yes, thank you, Chairman Glick. I think that is an excellent question, and immediately my mind uh, turned to the Northwest Power Pool Resource Adequacy Initiative. Uh, if you recall that map that Greg Carrington brought up about just how extensive that footprint is, one of the benefits of that extensive of, of a footprint is that the entities participating in that initiative are very diverse. We have winter peaking and summer peaking entities, we have entities that are public power and investor-owned utilities. We have entities that have surplus capacity, entities that are deficit. That diversity has really allowed us to come together to work on that initiative with the hopes of unlocking the benefits of diversity in a safe and reliable way. One of the elements that is necessary to do that is to have some common approaches to to such metrics, for example, agreeing to a common reliability metric of the risk of one day in 10 years, agreeing to what are the capacity critical hours where the grid is at greatest risk, which we realize is now not just when load is high, but when the combination of high load, low output from variable energy resources, and perhaps high exports or high interchange, when those come together, those are the capacity critical hours. So when we start working together and identifying the capacity critical hours across the Western grid, and we then agree to common approaches on how we assess the capacity contribution of each technology, whether it be storage hydro in the Northwest, wind in a particular zone, uh, solar or thermal resources, then we know we are in effect jointly establishing the resource adequacy level that we're trying to achieve, the contributions of different resources, and then and only then can we safely unlock the diversity in load, in generation resources, achieve resource adequacy while also delivering that at least cost. So uh, it's a very exciting time in terms of uh, tackling that challenge through a broad footprint that extends all the way from British Columbia down through to Nevada. Thank you, Mr. Holman. Uh, Ms. Bentley, did you have your arm up or hand up? Yes, thank you. I thought that was a good question, uh, Chairman Glick. Um, I was going to make very similar points to uh, Mr. Holman, but I'll just expand on that a little bit. Um, I do think there is a less scaled down version that is probably more workable across the West. As Elaine said in her talk, there's a lot of different opinions and a different um, views on resource adequacy across the West. Um, the diversity doesn't just exist in resources. It, there's diversity in risk tolerance. There's diversity in um, renewable um, outlooks. So I think that the first thing to do is to do what Mr. Freeman says and to start with the base data set. Um, if I, as the California ISO, know what the Northwest Power Pool is doing and I can count on their data, um, then I could do my own assessment of their resources. Um, likewise, a scaled down version would just be for them to give me the import data and say what is available to import. Um, so I don't think we have to go as far as having um, a, unique, a similar accounting methodology across the entire West. And then we can just start with data sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bentley. Ms. Hart, please go ahead. Thank you. So, yeah, I think this is a great question uh, as well, and, and I agree with a lot of the comments that have already been made. The, the only thing that I would add is that, that increasingly, well, resource adequacy has always been driven by weather phenomena um, on the load side, but we're going to be entering a, a new era here where a lot of the generation, the availability of generation is also uh, more weather driven than we're used to. And so I think at the, at the very least, it's important that the West have a coherent set of um, of weather data that can be used to identify what those really critical weather conditions are and that and that individual entities within the West are doing their planning, which I, I agree that it, it might be the case that not every playing entity wants to adopt the same standard or thinks about risks in the same way because the nature of some of these systems are very different. 
Um, but at the very least, we should be able to take a look at what happens when the West encounters those critical weather conditions. And when you stitch all of those plans together, uh, we need to make sure that we're okay. Uh, so I, I think that there's sort of a way to, to allow um, you know, entities to continue to do a more local look at resource adequacy, but if we don't supplement it with that larger view and those scenarios that are really consistent with the broader meteorological trends or, uh, across the whole region, then I think we, might, we risk missing a really important part of the, uh, the risk that we, we just don't understand very well today. Thank you very much, Ms. Hart. Um, back to you, Chairman Glick. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to turn to transmission, and I, we had, you know, uh, Commissioner Clements raised it, I think, very well in, in the first panel, and there was some discussion about it in both panel one and also this panel as well. And I want to, you know, there's there's so much discussion about transmission these days about the um, uh, the need to develop significant ad additional uh, transmission capacity across the country to access remote resources, for instance, or to improve reliability. I'm wondering, um, from a Western perspective, what you think are the barriers and what can be done, from whether at FERC or, or Congress or elsewhere, what policies, and state commissions as well, what policies need to be changed to get transmission built, not just, again, to, to, to be able to decarbonize the grid, which is obviously an important goal, but also to address resource adequacy issues, because um, in, in, at times we, we saw last summer, um, there were there were some transmission constraints that that impacted California as well in terms of the days that the two days that the rolling blackouts occurred. And I'm just wondering if there are I, I know it takes a while to build transmission, but what do you think we should be looking at in terms of improving the uh, the, the environment for transmission development um, across the West? Commissioner Agunda, please go ahead. Um, thank you, um, Commissioner Glick. I think I, I will just, uh, being the state's policy agency, I, I will I will take it at just a 10,000 foot level on this question. So one of the things um, that has come up in our SD100 implementation kickoff recently, uh, the single biggest uh, discussion was around increased transmission and the need for transmission. But two specific observations uh, from that conversation, and I just want to share, share for record here, uh, is the importance of looking at transmission planning in, in a longer time frame, not just a 10 year ahead time frame, but a longer time frame to really understand um, you know, you know, what is needed. And along with that comes the importance of understanding you know, the different scenarios, both on the demand as well as the resource mix we are planning for. Uh, with the increases in um, in planning for reduction in potentially polluting gas fleet, especially in local areas, uh, locally constrained areas, um, you know, from a, from an equity standpoint, which is essential, um, you look at um, you know developing a more comprehensive view of of what those long term both supply and demand uh, kind of scenarios are, and that that should really inform the transmission planning. So I think I just want to um, put it out there as as one of the most important things is having a long-term comprehensive regional viewpoint of how we are planning with the demand and the supply scenarios to understand what transmission is really needed. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lau, please go ahead. Yeah, so I, I just, so thank you. I just want to follow up what, what Gunda actually said. I mean, I, I think SMUD, I mean, as a, as a, pub, as a public owned utility, I mean, I think our general principle really supports the, the FERC Order 1000 that the cost should be allocated to commensurate with the benefit received. And I think a lot of times the holdup is really about how do you do that benefit allocation and, you know, how is this cost spread? And I think, you know, this is really FERC can actually come in and be very, very strategic in terms of offering incentives, exactly as what Commissioner Gunda said about having a, a longer look in terms of how is the West resources is going to transform when we actually try to get to a zero carbon future. And so to the extent if they can actually have policy that, that clearly incentivize those areas that where they have disputes, I think that would be actually very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lau. Uh, Mr. Freeman, please go ahead. Thank you, Naveen. Uh, uh, thanks for the question, Commissioner Glick. Uh, I'm going to offer a little bit different perspective based on my experience in Wyoming and, and Wyoming and I, th I think Idaho probably and Montana and some of the other Nevada obviously 
Uh, some of the other sparsely populated uh, big western states have a unique challenge. In Wyoming, about 50% of the land, which measures about 98,000 square miles in Wyoming, about 50% of that is owned by the federal government. And uh, getting transmission built in Wyoming is not really about incentives. It's about NEPA and trying to uh, get the permits necessary to build transmission. For example, Rocky Mountain Power began uh, planning and permitting for its Gateway uh, West project about, what was it, about 15 years ago. They're finally starting to uh, build some of the segments of that now. But they didn't really get all of the federal permitting that, that was required to go ahead with construction until about 2019. So, uh, you know, that that is a problem that we have uh, in the West, particularly in the public land states, that really can't be overcome by an incentive. And, and I'll have to tell you, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not a big fan of incentives. I think that... Uh, you know, to the extent that utilities uh, are able to rate base these investments in transmission, uh, have uh, access to formula rate making at FERC, and essentially pass those costs through to retail customers in the states, there isn't much risk associated with them. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Um, Chairman Glick, back to you. Okay, thank you, and I, I appreciate what you said, Mr. Freeman. I, I think that I think certainly we need to look at incentives, but we need to look at other policies as well. And I think you're right; that includes federal siting of transmission as well. Um, well, actually, Mr. Freeman, I could stay with you for a second. I, I uh, wanted to ask another question uh, regarding stakeholder involvement. Um, so we have, uh, you know, there are a lot of different processes obviously underway in the West with regard to resource adequacy, whether they be integrated resource plans that are overseen by state utility commissions or self-regulated utilities, or what's going on uh, in the Northwest uh, with the Northwest Power Pool with regard to the resource adequacy construct they are putting together. I'm wondering uh, if you have any thoughts on stakeholder involvement in those processes in terms of um, what, what, uh, what, what, what opportunities there are and what opportunities you'd like to see. But I'd like to start with you, but also uh, uh, have others, others weigh in as well in terms of stakeholder involvement and resource adequacy decision making. Sorry, I thought I thought I unmuted myself. Uh, thank you for that question, and I, I think you'll probably hear more on this topic from uh, some of my uh, counterparts from other states that are also consumer advocates in later panels. Uh, frankly, uh, you know, I I. Uh, since I've been the consumer advocate in Wyoming, I've sought out every opportunity to be involved in uh, regional uh, assessments and, and regional decision making, whether that's at WAC, uh, whether that's at uh, EIM, uh, every opportunity, because I've found over the years that the old adage is certainly true. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu, likely. And so uh, I think it's important for uh, all stakeholders to have a meaningful op opportunity to participate uh, in these discussions and know that they're being heard. I have personally not uh, had any outreach uh, from anybody associated with the Northwest Power Pool uh, as far as stakeholder engagement, I would certainly appreciate uh, something like that, as I know uh, my counterparts in other states would. So I, I think it's one of those things as we approach this regionalization and cooperation, whether that turns out to be a Westwide RTO or not, every incremental level that we go through, we need to design the process with stakeholder engagement in mind so that we can bring that diversity of views 
to the table. I think the the discussions and the policies uh, that come out of that will only be enriched uh, if more stakeholders and more views are accommodated. Thank you very much, Mr. Freeman. We have a number of people um, who will continue to answer this question. Mr. Olson, please go ahead first. All right, thank you very much. I recognize I was having some technical difficulties, so hopefully this is a little bit better from an audio perspective. It sounds great, thank you. Go ahead. All right, thank you. So, uh, Commissioner, uh, Chairman Glick, I really appreciate the question. It is a good question. Um, as public power, SRP really strongly believes in the public stakeholder process. Uh, it's, it's a point in which we pride ourselves in. Uh, one thing that I would note as we look forward, we are working through continued evolution. So we talk about evolution of our system and our resources to modernize our fleet to get to a lower carbon resource set. But we, we recognize that it's not just resources anymore. So traditionally, we've been looking at a public stakeholder process that is uh, all about the resource side of things. And as we get into this, we're recognizing the need to evolve our public stakeholder process to include um, kind of an integrated system plan is what we're calling it. It's it's very much in progress as, a, as we're trying to develop and evolve. And so we're not just looking at uh, what does it look like from a resource perspective in terms of meeting adequacy, but it has everything to do with distribution. Uh, as you see, additional kind of uh, customer sighted generation show up as well as um, broader uh, transmission planning fitting into the entire suite. So it's one collective discussion. Uh, I think the challenge that we see working through stakeholder processes, as many of you may be aware, is um, there can be vocal minorities that are really loud, and it's important that we structure our stakeholder processes to try and adequately capture kind of the collective voice of all of our customers, uh, and as well as key interest groups. And so um, we think that plays a critical role with respect to continued evolution of SRP system. And we think that that plays really well in terms of kind of regional uh, processes. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Olson. Uh, Ms. Bentley, please go ahead. You're next. Thank you. Um, as a professional stakeholder myself, um, I really appreciate this question. Um, I think broad stakeholder um, participation is vital to well-functioning processes in the RA program. I think a really important thing to keep in mind is that the RA program across the West is incredibly complicated. Whether you're talking about the Northwest Power Pool, new rules, individual IRPs, or the California ISO processes, everyone has their own unique language. It's not standardized even the way we speak about RA. And so in order to get both clarity of thought and get new ideas, it's important to have stakeholders from across the West involved in these different participation um, opportunities. I think it is interesting that a lot of times it's up to individual companies to take the onus themselves to go to these different events, um, to go out of your own service area, for example. Um, I think increased encouragement of this would be really helpful. Um, if you go to someone's website, for example, sometimes it's hard to figure out even how to participate. Um, and just encouraging that ability for participation, I, I think would be very beneficial. Also note that stakeholders provide a valuable role in oversight. Um, sometimes I think areas get carried away um, and there's group think. And what stakeholders can do is they could kind of shake people out of this box um, and provide valuable insights um, that probably wouldn't have occurred without their participation. Thank you. Very well, thank you, Ms. Bentley. Ms. Hart, you're next, please go ahead. Sorry, I think I was muted. Um, I, I agree with uh, uh, with most of the comments that Ms. Bentley just made. I've, I've been on sort of both sides of this challenge, um, both representing a utility that was rolling out a new resource adequacy model and framework, um, and also working as a technical expert on behalf of stakeholders who are um, trying to apply it for scrutiny to a resource adequacy um, modeling process. And I can say that it's challenging from both sides uh, especially, so from the utilities perspective or the planning, you know, planners perspective, uh, there is, there, you know, it's important that we can, that we uh, capture more of the complexity of the system, especially if we want to do sort of service or do justice to these new technologies, renewables, energy storage, demand flexibility. 
uh, capturing the contributions of all of these things to resource advocacy is very complex. It requires really complicated models. These are not spreadsheet models. Uh, this is a lot of, there's a lot of data uh, and usually com complicated optimization models that you have to build to do these things. It's not easy for people to look under the hood of these models and a lot of them are proprietary and a lot of the data is confidential. Um, so even if you do your best to try to make sure that you're capturing all of these new dynamics, you know, that kind of cut against, cuts against the transparency and that's, that's challenging um, from both perspectives. On, on the stakeholder side, um, you know, it, it's really it's really difficult to counter an argument that a uh, utility needs to take an action because they have to keep the lights on. Uh, that sort of that argument sort of trumps trumps all in a lot of these these conversations. And so I, I think that just you know makes it more important that in the context of RA specifically, which I think will be driving more and more procurement decisions uh, going forward as we continue to have uh, retirements in the region, it, it really uh, makes transparency. Uh, critically important and public scrutiny all the more important. So if, to the extent that there are new uh, programs being developed that are addressing RA, it's really important that people be able to have full access to the models and the data that are going into those, um, into that work, and that the findings and the assumptions are very clearly communicated in a way that it doesn't require uh, having a technical expert to engage um, at, at a high level. and. Uh, if you do have a technical expert engaged, that they're able to look under the hood and, and check that um, things are being done appropriately. Thank you very much, Ms. Hart. Uh, Ms. Jalau, please go ahead. Well, thank you. I mean, I think that's a great question, Chairman Glick. I mean, I think as a public owned utility, I absolutely agree, you know, with what, what uh, Mr. Olson and Mr. Freeman had said. I mean, certainly, you know, we support a broad stakeholder process. That's how we always do it as a public owned utility. We don't make money on our capital investment, you know, because the business model is very different. So I think as you engage this broad stakeholder process and you weigh those comments, I think it's absolutely important to understand well who is at the end going to pay to implement those policies or the framework that you're talking about. Because at the end of the day, as Mr. Freeman said, you know, who the customers of the utilities uh, or the customer who's implementing those, who are they? You know, who is actually speaking on their behalf and making sure that they're aspect of the conversation is taken into account. So making sure that, so that, that's my comment, is making sure that we always have the customers and the community that we're serving. Now, ultimately, that's what, we, that's what we're doing as utility, making sure that they're not inadvertently harmed or certainly paying for something that they don't get a direct benefit from. Thank you very much, Ms. Chen Lau. Uh, finally, we have Commissioner Gunda. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Devin. Um, uh, Chairman Glick, that's an that's a extremely important question. Thank you for raising that and framing that. Uh, I kind of, in my earlier uh, response, I said, uh, I kind of mentioned that CEC is a, a policy agency. So I, I, I do want to uh, contextualize in that sense because, you know, we, we, we are not a UKD's commission, um, you know, our, our kind of a Kaiser. So we, we have to figure out, uh, you know, our role in this process. So I think I'm, I'm going to speak from the process of planning for the long term and then thinking about uh, the assessments and how best we engage the public. So I think, you know, it's, it's essential that, you know, we provide procedural equity for all stakeholders. And I think as the number of points were mentioned here, I think, you know, not all stakeholders have the same level of understanding of the planning. And I think it's imperative and it's incumbent upon, you know, the, the policymakers as well as as, as critical pl um, uh, planners to really make that information accessible and you know, both from uh, uh, the way we speak about it, we talk about it, but also geographically. I think it's important to reach uh, to uh, to the communities um, and understanding and, and you know explaining what we're trying to do and, and understanding what their concerns are, but also the input. And it doesn't just uh, look at, you know, typically the vulnerable communities um, you know, that we speak about, but also extends to the urban and rural uh, kind of framework. So how do we think about resource planning, both from the needs of um, urban communities as well as as um, rural communities, and how do we think about it uh, holistically? You know, we we in our kick kickoff meeting we did hear a couple of uh, high level concerns uh, and and kind of uh, observations from that meeting is that you know there is you know beginning to have you know some sort of reservation and and you know beginnings to have pushback uh, on development of more and more renewables. In, in kind of areas uh, that you know might not you know want more 
uh, solar panels, um, you know, in their communities, uh, you know, put around their communities and such. And these are important conversations to have to un understand, you know, what what levels of land use uh, we have and how do we best structure that in a way that uh, all the voices are heard. And I just want to transition here into uh, a point that Mr. Olson was trying to make uh, on the distribution planning side. Most of our conversation today has been structured around the bulk planning uh, and then the long term idea of the bulk planning and, and hence the transmission needs. It's important to really consider uh, the value of the DERs. How do we best think about uh, the, the distributed resources and the DR to understand you know, the, the deduction in the bulk grid that we might you know, have both from the cost perspective, but also improving the resiliency perspective. And this also comes from discussions you know, uh, with, with the communities. So just kind of um, recognizing the importance of the con uh, question that you raised and, and really uh, want uh, to encourage uh, ourselves, uh, but everybody to ensure that we have a robust public process as we make these critical decisions, both in the short and the long term. Well, thank you for the detailed answer. Uh, we have Mr. Mark Holman. Please go ahead. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Chairman Swick. I'll be brief and really uh, focus my comments uh, to your question on the Northwest Power Pool uh, Resource Adequacy Initiative. I, I think stakeholder engagement is always very important, and I know that's something we've uh, focused on in the Resource Adequacy Initiative, reaching out to stakeholders multiple times. But I think it's also important to note um, that when you have such a diverse footprint, as I discussed earlier, uh, what we're finding, which is actually uh, quite refreshing, is we have so many different voices uh, from the outset involved in the design of the program because of that diversity, that often when we reach out to stakeholders and we're, whether we're talking to someone in the, the, the renewable community or, or perhaps a load serving entity, they share similar viewpoints often to other entities that are already participating in that initiative from the outset. So there's there's great thoughts and, and input from stakeholders and that reach out is important, but, but it really does complement what is your starting point? Are you starting a resource adequacy program from a, a single interest or are you starting a resource adequacy program from a very diverse group of memberships where you have hydro entities, you know, renewable and thermal entities, entities that are surplus, entities that are short. And so we've really benefited from that, that having that diversity at the table, we really have no choice in terms of getting a program off the ground when you have that diversity, other than to pursue industry best practices and develop a program uh, that, that meets the reliability and consumer uh, economic objectives. Uh, otherwise, somebody at that table is not going to be very happy because all those interests are there. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Holman. I appreciate those responses. Very helpful. Um, I'm going to turn it out over to uh, Commissioner Clements for her questions now. Thanks, Chairman Glick. I really enjoyed hearing those perspectives on your last question. Um, I wanted to ask a question about demand side resources, which has come up a little sporadically in, in the context of this conversation and maybe start with Ms. Hart and then um, others who, who want to weigh in. Clearly in the last, you know, uh, in the February event and in last August event in California, um, in, the, in the real time emergency conditions scenario, demand side resources can play um, uh, an important role and probably need more systemization uh, to be effect to be as effective as they can be as well as to get paid at what they should. How do we, how do we think about it in the resource adequacy context, appreciating the difficulty that you mentioned, Ms. Hart, around um, modeling these these demand side resources and also appreciating their potential? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. I think that um, this is one of those areas where we have a lot of work to do in the resource adequacy space to understand the contributions of demand flexibility in particular when the system is under great stress. Um, I, you know, I, I, my big takeaway from the events in California last summer was that we have quite a bit more demand flexibility than we plan for. People should be compensated, uh, right, when they change their thermostats because they're asked to. Um, but, you know, we got 4,000, I think it was about 4,000 megawatts um, uh, to avoid a second, you know, another round of, of rolling blackouts in that event. And so I think we need to be thinking more expansively about, about what demand flexibility really looks like. In the work that I'm doing uh, right now, we're kind of thinking about, so far, demand flexibility is 
you know, think about it, not necessarily um, by shoehorning it into the model to make it look like a resource, which is the way that we sort of traditionally do it. We have to make it look like something that we understand, which is usually, oh, it looks like a call option. Maybe it's an energy limited call option, something like that. And then we can put it into our resource adequacy model and dispatch it when we need. Instead of starting from that framework of, of thinking about it as, as a resource, we're looking at sort of what's the nature of the problem that the demand flexibility is gonna be asked to address. And so we're looking at what are the times of year, the times of day, the frequency, the duration, of the types of events where we might encounter a shortage. And then you can design your demand flexibility programs, um, particularly those that are targeted toward these emergency events around those types of insights. Um, ideally, you know, you would design the program, you get information about how those programs are responding to situations and you would be pulling all of that back into your modeling. We're, we're still a ways off, I think, from having that sophisticated of an understanding across the West of, of what we're able to do with these programs. So I, I'm not sure that I have a lot of a lot of answers for you just to say that this is an area that's critically important and one um, that will be pretty focused on in, in our work. Uh, and before I wrap up, I, I guess I'll just say one of the pieces that's most important is the fact that during these events, which in the West are are typically these really hot summer days, you know, later later in the later in the day when we hit these constrained conditions. That's precisely the period where we have a lot of thermal um, demand on the system, and so it's really important that we tie the availability of those programs to the actual weather conditions that are being experienced when the grid is constrained. The size of the resource is actually larger during those periods of constraints than they typically would be on maybe a, a lower temperature August day, for example. Thank you very much, Ms. Hart. Uh, Commissioner Gunda, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Commissioner Clements, uh, for that question. Uh, just at a very high level, um, just a couple of observations from uh, last year, um, the August events, but also uh, last week, uh, as we were trying to uh, get through the, the, the heat event. So I think there is uh, a lot of opportunity uh, on the demand response, uh, as uh, Ms. Hart noted, um, between the day ahead uh, forecast projection and the actuals that were observed uh, last year during the heat waves, there was indeed a 4,000 megawatt um, uh, kind of delta. Uh, some of that might be weather, but you know that doesn't undermine the amount of uh, demand flexibility opportunity that we have. A couple of points to uh, tie to that is today the way uh, demand response is primarily taken into account is, is through the modifications to the demand forecast that we do, uh, looking at uh, an adjustment to the demand forecast. Uh, but as, as programs continue to evolve, especially proxy DR programs, um, as well as uh, real-time DR opportunity in the markets, um, I think it's essential to understand when they're available, as, as Ms. Hart noted, uh, and, and how best we can quantify them. Uh, two things uh, worth of notice there is in the short term um, that we, we've observed uh, you know, both last week and in the last year, there are several opportunities on the demand side today. Uh, one is um, looking at you know, the, the load flex uh, uh, element of that from you know, conservation, uh, but also the ability to potentially island um, you know, certain buildings or, or reduce the amount of um, demand on the grid. Uh, specifically on that, uh, uh, tying it back to the long-term projection of having about 8 million vehicles um, on the grid uh, between 2030 and 2035 in California, uh, we are looking at about half a million megawatt hours of, of batteries on wheels. So it becomes important to uh, to ensure that we bring them into some sort of a programmatic structure where we, where we can really realize the benefits um, of, of such amount of storage um, uh, behind, the, uh, behind the meter. I just wanted to note that. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, just one, one more point I'd like to make. Uh, you talked about the systematization of some of the lessons learned. Uh, we did uh, take some um, uh, kind of work together uh, as, as the three agencies to systematize much of the work that we were able to do on the demand side last year. Uh, one of the programmatic elements that came out is the Public Utilities Commission's ELRP, the Emergency uh, Load Reduction Program for this summer, which is a pilot program to essentially try and recruit uh, customers and pay them under these emergency conditions, and and really observe uh, you know you know how much uh, ability we have to incentivize the customers and pay them. So that's an important element we're working on as well. Thank you very much, Commissioner. 
Mr. Freeman, you are next. Please go ahead. Uh, I think this is an excellent question, uh, Commissioner Clements, and, and I think that uh, demand side management and demand response in particular can p play a, a critical uh, role in uh, resource adequacy. I, I think it's a resource that can be relied upon, and if it's uh, you know widely uh, widely rolled out uh, in the West, it can even be aggregated and and uh, traded and uh, used as a regional resource adequacy uh, tool. I want to make the point, though, that uh, we've all uh, talked today about the diversity in the West, and, and that's true. We do have a lot of diversity, but we need to pay attention to uh, how demand response programs work in the future, particularly if we follow this path towards uh, total decarbonization where uh, we have uh, electric space heating. Electric space uh, conditioning is not the same in Wyoming as it is in Southern California. Uh, based on what I know about technologies that are available today, I would suspect that if we were going to electrify uh, space conditioning in Wyoming, it would be radiant electric uh, space conditioning because there are a lot of days in Wyoming in the wintertime where there just isn't enough ambient heat in the atmosphere uh, for an air source heat pump to do an adequate job of space conditioning. So uh, are customers going to react to uh, turning their thermostat down in the wintertime the same way they would react to turning their thermostat down in California in the summertime? I don't know. Th those are things that we need to really have a better understanding of before we uh, build things and set policies in place uh, that are hard to change in the future and, and have regrets. Thank you very much, Mr. Freeman. Uh, Mr. Olson, you are next. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. It is a good question, Commissioner, and uh, appreciate it at SRP. We actually strongly believe in demand side uh, tools as, as kind of one of our historical practices with respect to resource adequacy has really been about field diversity and flexibility. And as we kind of get into a changing world moving forward, looking at lower carbon, uh, a lower carbon free fleet, uh, field diversity gets to be a little bit of a challenge until we start looking at some of those demand side components. And so we, we strongly support demand side programs. I mean, everything from our time of use program where we kind of have um, pricing adjustments during certain periods of the time that allows that provides customers the right incentives every day of the year to adjust to their utilization to help kind of carve out some of the, the peak requirements. Uh, we also look at um, thermostat programs and, and other types of programs where I mean, we hear it very loudly from our customers that there's a good contingent of them that are interested in helping us to solve that problem with respect to kind of hitting that peak. Um, but when we look at it, we're still growing. And while we expect that the demand side um, tool set will continue to grow with it, it, it's hard to see that offsetting our 2% uh, plus growth that we're forecasting year over year uh, sustained. And so it's going to be an important part of our programs, but it doesn't necessarily uh, alleviate some of the broader concerns we have regarding resource adequacy. Thank you very much, Mr. Olson. Mr. Lau? Please go ahead. Yeah, so Commissioner Clements, so uh, like like SRP, SMUD has been really in the forefront in terms of looking at, you know, how do you make customer to be part of the solution? So we have a long history of, you know, using demand response as a way to, as I think as Ms. Gunda said about, you know, as a reducing a low forecast. But we think we're at a stage now, you really need to transition that uh, into a resource adequacy piece, into creating something that you can really count on and it's instead of just something that, you know, you're just going to reduce load and not really taking into the kind of the live operations. I think as, you know, as the West goes deeper and deeper into decarbonizing the grid, uh, SMUD, you know, I, I think you know that we have a very aggressive 2030 plan that we plan to remove all carbon, you know, from our power supply. And one of the ways to do it is to 
really capitalize on our customer investment. So we are planning to spend about $2 billion in terms of incentivizing rooftop solar in addition to batteries. So we just dropped the rate that we're allowing customers uh, uh, to basically get on a, a virtual power plant, what we call it, the VPP plants, that we can start not only incentivify them to put in the, uh, the, infra- the, the capital investments, but also give them ongoing payments as we need them to really help stabilize the grid or provide services to the grid. And we're also doing the same thing right now in terms of doing a lot of pilots, what we need to do to vehicle the grid. I think as, uh, as Ms. Gunda said about, you know, California, we have a very, very aggressive goal in terms of getting to, uh, uh, I think, 8 million, I think, electric vehicles by 2030. I think SMUD's share of that is about 280,000. And so we just did, you know, if you if you think about the, the amount of uh, uh, capacity that's available, it's almost like 700 megawatts for SMUD. And that's that that's not counting everyone, you know, joining and, and, and basically connected to the grid when when, when the grid is in stress. So we think and on our and our system is about a three thousand megawatt system. So you can see that, you know, if we're gonna add a couple hundred megawatts of uh, uh I'm gonna say a rooftop plus storage and another couple hundred megawatts, you know, five, six hundred megawatts of vehicle to grid, now you're really gonna have a huge impact in terms of the resource adequacy planning and monetization. And one of the nice things for us is we have a, a very, very heavy stakeholder process. We actually have took, took our plan, our 2030 plan, we had a six months uh, uh, stakeholder process asking our customer what are they willing to do to participate with us. And we work with the, the storage companies, we work with the IPPs in terms of, uh, we also work with third party aggregators in terms of what, what are the barriers for them if they really want to start you know, aggregating all the customer uh, resources and make it to be a part of a, a resource adequacy or something to can bid into it. So this is something I do believe that uh, is the way for the future. I don't think I don't I think any utilities who is serious about you know getting to a, a zero carbon future. I don't think this is something that you can n- ignore. And I think you do have to make DR as part of your resource adequacy as part of your IRP and your DRP. Uh, the, uh, sorry, the resource planning piece. And because it has a huge impact in terms of how do you uh, your investments on your distribution systems and also your investments in your transmission systems, even impacting because right now currently SMUD we have five gas fire plants that we're going to try to decommission. So our plan right now is to decommission two of those by 2025, uh, repurpose two of those into peakers using either green hydrogen or renewable natural gas, and then we have our consumers power plant, which is the biggest plant in about 600 megawatts megawatts that we need for base load. And so you have to think about how do you integrate the demand side, a low flexibility side into the generation operations as part of the resource accuracy mix. So I think that's this is definitely the way of the future. And that's a great question, Commissioner Clemens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lau. Back to you, Commissioner Clemens. Thanks, Naveen. And thank you, Mr. Lau. That was a great answer. I'm impressed. Um, I want to follow up on Chairman Glick's transmission question. And um, in the first panel, I asked about, you know, the concerns with going down a resource adequacy path as a region and going down a different set of considerations on the market uh, path as a region, and then going down or not going down a path as a region or a set of subregions on transmission front to get through um, to, to keep ensuring reliability at low cost going forward. And I, I, I have concern about these things being taken on in silos, and I'm interested to hear the perspective of folks on this call uh, as to whether or not they share that concern and what um, they think the options are that the commission can do to help uh, or that that otherwise can be done to help. Mr. Lau, please go ahead. Thank you. I, I guess I can start. I, I think you know absolutely that you know, you do not want to look at you know the uh, the all those things in units. I mean, I mean in isolation. You really need to look at you know what is the what is the integrated resource plans going forward. You know how does the, I think the resources we talked about from the customer side all the way to the generation side, and then understanding what the impact will be and a different and a different implication that it has on your transmission planning piece. And because when you talk about the bulk electric system, you're talking a much bigger uh, footprint than just one single utility or even one BA. So you do actually have to look at it from a west-wide regional piece. You have to take a look into account 
you know, what all the demand side resources that's available for the whole area, what the impact that it has on the transmission, and then also equally important on the generation transition. Because right now, uh, certainly in California, you're seeing all the resources being, uh, I think a lot of resources being taken off the grid. You know, you, you have the ones through cooling, right? You have nuclear coming off. You have, you know, um, a lot of the coal, you know, contracts actually being being displaced. So, you know, there is a, a resource constraint that's going to happen, that's going to transition, that's a great go to decarbonize from the generation side to the distribution side. And so the transmission piece are absolutely, you know, we recommend for the commission to push for, you know, a clear way to evaluate the system as a whole and not just in isolations or in pieces. Thank you very much again, Mr. Lau. Please go ahead, Ms. Bentley. I think um, I also share your concern that transmission gets siloed. I think transmission connects not just the regions, but the RA market to the energy market. When you're evaluating transmission benefits, it's not just deliverability for an asset to your area, it also provides reduction in congestion costs for consumers. So I think when you start doing these studies that expand across regions, you get into challenging technical issues with how do you value transmission and then who pays for it. I, mean, I think California has suffered um, over the last couple of years, past decade probably with this issue. Um, for example, renewables are pretty saturated in California, um, and there are wind resources that very much want to have lines built and sent to California, but it's um, how is that decision made and in what process? Right, we go around and around here. Um, is it the CPUC that chooses the resources and then it's the CAISO that builds the transmission, but who actually pulls that trigger and who actually pays for it has never really been settled. Um, and here we are 10 years later where it's, many studies show that it would be beneficial to import more renewables into California, but we simply can't figure out a process to pay for the transmission. Um, I think merchant transmission, um, although is of interest to many, many um, developers right now, um, has stagnated due to this uh, siloed kind of nature of the different regions. Um, and anything we could do to push that forward, I think will only benefit consumers. Um, and reliability and, honestly, the greening of our grid. Thank you very much, Ms. Bentley. Mr. Holman, please go ahead. You're next. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. A, a really good question and, and something that has come up repeatedly uh, in recent years, and, and I think the word that is often used is incremental. Having been involved in many regional initiatives in the West, both those that have succeeded and those that have failed, it has become clear over the last nearly two decades that I've been involved, that the incremental voluntary approach really works in the West, that entities very much desire maintaining their local autonomy, uh, examining each opportunity as an incremental opportunity and ensuring that there's a business case for them. Um, in terms of it becoming fragmented or you know, organized markets, perhaps not fitting well with a resource adequacy program or not fitting well with uh, transmission planning, uh, efforts. I actually think it's quite the opposite, surprisingly. What I've seen is that, you know, after the launch of the energy imbalance market, the Western EIM of California, and, and more recently, SPP's WISE, entities, when they're taking on the next initiative, are very mindful of those initiatives. So when we're examining developing a resource adequacy program, we're thinking very much about how do we design this in a way that it works well with the existing bilateral markets, with participation in the EIM, both from a, a timelines and processes and transmission availability perspective. And I think of it as an incremental building block approach. Maybe a, a good example will be, you know, as the Northwest Power Pool Resource Adequacy Program moves forward and we launch it, I think we're gonna get fantastic data out of that initiative that's really gonna help us hone in on transmission upgrades that provide the best value for unlocking the low-hanging fruit to ensuring resource adequacy through targeted uh, uh, examinations under the resource adequacy program. So I think of them as incremental, complementary, carefully constructed, and really our only path that I think we're gonna be successful in continuing to make progress as the grid transforms. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Holman. Gwenda, you're next. Please go ahead. And thank you. I thank you, Commissioner Clements, for that question. Um, I'm glad Paul went first, and I just want to really give uh, kudos to both SMUD, 
as well as LADWP for some of the most comprehensive analysis that they're doing, uh, connecting all the way from the distribution uh, side uh, to uh, to the to the needs on the on the bulk grid to look at exactly what the needs are in terms of uh, new megawatts that need to be added to the grid, uh, and it's a microcosm to really understand for us as a state policy um, uh, team to really understand and and take lessons from that. So uh, one of the things I, I I mentioned was the SP100 implementation kickoff uh, with the multi um, agency as well as balancing the authorities and and the broad stakeholder engagement. And, and things that are coming out of that, um, as again, you know, you have, if you're just looking at the bulk grid uh, and, and how you want to uh, build for the new um, the demands, there seems to be a lot of assessments that require a large amount of transmission. But as you integrate, uh, you know, more the DER sensitivities, the opportunities on the demand flexibility, you begin to see a large reduction in the need for resource built. For example, in uh, one of the scenarios that was modeled, was looking at um, you know a, a, an amount of flexibility, load flexibility that could change uh, or reflect the resource build, and and we've observed that that the reduction there uh, has a huge uh, change in um, the the need for uh, new procurement. Uh, so I think you know, to your point, I think it's important to look at the entirety of the system as a whole and and figuring out how best to um, understand the need for transmission both interregional, but also within the state as we think about local capacity needs. Thank you very much, Commissioner Binda. Mr. Olson, you're next. Please go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I, I agree with uh, the comment that it is a good question. Um, I think Mr. Holman beat me to it a little bit in terms of some of the comments I would make, and I would very much kind of support some of the same concepts is that um, as we've seen the incremental progress with respect to markets expanding, looking at the success of EIM and some of the additional coordination that's been going on with respect to the possibility of expanding those principles to a day ahead market. Um, while it feels very much that resource adequacy may be in a complete silo relative to transmission planning, I think what you're really seeing, at least what I'm experiencing, is a really good integration of the transmission planning conversation and the resource adequacy concept as it, as it deploys to that day ahead discussion and framework as we work through. Um, it's pretty clear that kind of the, the most constructive path forward from a transmission perspective and how to kind of help make it feel less de-siloed in my mind is the concept of really trying to focus on common taxonomy and better understanding uh, of resource adequacy and kind of how we're constructing towards that. Uh, a little bit more transparency regarding uh, imports, exports, those types of assumptions on our systems can really help to understand where the transmission constraints are. Uh, it, it will help to break down, I believe, some of the barriers that kind of exist with respect to merchant interest regarding transmission versus kind of utility and load serving interest regarding transmission. And um, it, yeah, I, I would just kind of echo the concept that the incremental approach is allowing what I would say is the conversation to evolve with respect to how we step into a little bit more robust coordination across the West. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Ms. Hart, please go ahead. You're next. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add to this conversation is that sort of is on a technical side, uh, you know, transmission and transmission related risks are often excluded from RA analysis. And that's that's often just sort of a necessary simplification. And it's I think it's acceptable if you're looking at a relatively small um, area. As we widen this the geographic scope of, the, of these exercises and we try to get sort of a more holistic view of RA in the West, that uh, those risks related to transmission um, become more important and they need to be captured within, within that analysis. And I think that that can help us to, to break down some of the, at least the technical siloing between RA and transmission. You have to kind of understand the limitations of the of the current transmission system if you want to say something about, you know, the value of, of adding to the transmission system, especially if you're, if you're thinking about value in terms of RA. It, it's possible if we find um, in this sort of west-wide work that there are specific transmission um, constraints that you're hitting up upon during these weather conditions frequently. Um, that that could be used as as justification for examining you know expansion of of that path or something along those lines. So I, I would just say that um, siloing in the in the 
and the analytical sphere is also uh, real and, and is something we need to work on. All right. Thank you, Ms. Hart. Uh, Commissioner Clements, back to you. Thanks, I mean, I, I appreciate that input and I'm processing it. And I, I think the, the EIM is, is, there's no better example of the success of an incremental approach relative to customer savings uh, and dollars saved. Of course, there's a lot more efficiencies on the table. The flip side of that incremental coin is that the issues are getting urgent. And if we think about the responsibilities of the commission from a long-term perspective, which are, um, uh, you know, protecting customers, just and reasonable rates and reliability, there's there's so much incrementalism at some point it flips over and then those two things are at the expense of that, right? And so that tension is real and I just would encourage you to keep it in mind as you push forward in these conversations. Thank you for the, for the time to be. Chair Clements, Chairman Glick. Thank you, Commissioner Clements. Thank you, Ms. Levine. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Christie to see if he has any questions. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I want to ask, first of all, I want to start with uh, Paul Al. Uh, and Paul, first of all, I really enjoyed meeting with you and your staff. Uh, very enjoyable meeting and informative. Um, my first, my question to you is, it, at the very end of your statement, I, I thought I heard you say, I want to ask for a clarification. You said something about, and I don't remember whether you put a knot in there or not, but about mandatory capacity markets. Were you saying they, you want to see mandatory capacity markets in, in the Western or you do not? You do not. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So well, just, Thank you so much for the clarification, Commissioner. All right. I, I, I thought that was the, I thought that was the answer, but I wanted to, to get that clarified. And I, but I do want to open it up to everyone else as well on that same issue. And as you look at the future, of a potential Western RTO or, 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 or something something other than an RTO, but uh, in supplies to, to CAISO as well. Um, does anyone want to advocate or see a role for mandatory capacity markets in resource adequacy the way we have in the Eastern RTOs? Yeah, it sounds like a groundswell uh, of not wanting uh, mandatory RTOs, or maybe there's a groundswell of, of yes, you do, but you don't want to say it. So, um, but I'd love to hear your comments on on why you think that that uh, you know that kind of approach, uh, uh, mandatory capacity market is not um, is not something you would want in the West. Thank you, Commissioner Christie. We first have Bryce Freeman. Please go ahead, Mr. Freeman. Uh, thank you, Naveen. Uh, good question. Uh, Mr. Christie, and I, I guess I'll just step right out. Uh, I think that I don't understand how you can develop a sound resource adequacy construct um, that provides the lowest cost resource adequacy assurance to customers without a capacity market. I've thought about this a lot over the years. Energy only markets I don't think work. Uh, I think that was part of the problem in Texas in February. The system needs reliability and it costs money. And reliability in the form of capacity that can be dispatched when it's needed, whether that's battery storage or gas or coal or uh, something else, hydrogen. Uh, the market or the customers need that reliability, and I don't see how you value that prudently without making a market for it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Freeman. Mr. Holdman, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Christie, uh, for the question. I know that over the years that the topic of resource adequacy has come up in the West, and from time to time, uh, the concept of a centralized capacity market in the West has been raised. To be very candid, uh, I don't, I can't recall when I've heard support for that in the West. There is generally strong resistance. Uh, to that that structure from the perspective of, again, entities in the West uh, wanting an incremental approach, wanting maximum local autonomy. 
I think as we look to developing the Northwest Power Pool RA program, we're very much trying to achieve that, that interest and that desire, still having a capacity market in the form of bilateral transactions, but allowing each entity to have its autonomy over how it meets its share of the regional reliability needs. So having common metrics that we're trying to achieve, uh, common calculations on the capacity contribution of each different technology, but then maintaining the autonomy of entities to decide what is the mix of resources, whether owned or contracted for, that works best for them, achieved within the context of a bilateral market as opposed to a, a more formal structured centralized capacity market that, that we really haven't seen any, any appetite for in the West in my experience. Thank you, Mr. Holman. Ms. Bentley, please go ahead. Thank you so much for this question. I, I think it's a great one. Um, first, a bilateral market is definitely still a market and we have a robust one here in the West. I think capacity markets work best when you have a uniform product um, and when you have resources that where you could easily compare their reliability, I mean, they have a similar obligation to the market. I think the diversification of resources out here in the West um, from year to year um, and from hour to hour even on what their contribution to reliability is, makes it really challenging to run a market um, similar to the Eastern styles. Um, so as much as I could see benefits of capacity markets in general, I just don't think they're well suited to the West resource mix or um, a diverse set of buyers. Thank you very much, Ms. Bentley. Back to you, Commissioner Chris. Uh, well, thank you very much. And just one follow up on that. Um, so I'm going to take from that answer then that, that that, and I would have put this out to all of you, could we summarize it then that in, in the West, you want, in a general sense, the responsibility for resource adequacy to, re to remain essentially uh, at, the, at the LSC and the, and the state level, much like SPP and MISO, as opposed to any move towards these centralized capacity markets. Is that fair to say? I think... Thank you for the question. I think it's important to differentiate between the responsibility of maintaining reliability um, and running a capacity market. I do think a ISO RTO structure is really well suited to being responsible for um, reliability, the provider of last resort in some, in some circumstances in the West. Um, but I don't think that the way to do that is through a capacity market. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bentley. Mr. Olson, please go ahead. Thank you for the question, Commissioner. I think it's, um, it, it is a good one, and I, I agree with Ms. Bentley in this particular case. And to, to answer your question directly, when you look at uh, an entity like SRP, I think we've got a long proven track record of having been very successful with respect to uh, meeting our resource adequacy needs and really maintaining our reliability as a public power entity. Um, we really are focused on reliability first. Uh, you know, it's reliability at reasonable cost. And it's, um, I, I think that's where we have concerns, quite frankly, when it comes to looking at centralized capacity markets, because in a way it feels very much like we lose control over our ability to kind of look out for the reliability of power for our customers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Olson. We have Mr. Freeman, please go ahead. Thank you, Navin. And, and Commissioner Christie, maybe I, uh, my earlier comments would benefit from a little clarification. I'm not here today to advocate uh, for the creation of an RTO in the West. I think uh, it, it's way too early to go down that road. I think there's a lot of important steps that need to be taken and should be taken uh, as interim steps. So I'm all about uh, the incremental kind of organic uh, development of cooperation and collaboration in the West before we get uh, to the point of considering an RTO. I guess my thought is, is if we ultimately get to the, that point, I don't see any difference between the West. I mean, you've got a lot of, Iowa is the leading wind state in the nation. Uh, 
and you've still got some coal in Pennsylvania. You've got gas scattered around. You've got hydro coming in from Canada. I don't see what makes the West unique from the East as far as a a capacity market would would be concerned. So I just think if we get to the point of having a full-on RTO in the West, a capacity market might be a pretty good idea. Thank you very much, Mr. Freeman. I see Mr. Paul Lau's hand raised. Please go ahead, Mr. Lau. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think, I think uh, Mr. Freeman, I think that's, I think what you, uh, thank you for the clarifications. So I think what you're seeing is happening in the West exactly what Mr. Poland said about there is an organic move right now, you know, into, you know, something kind of resembling like an organic RTO. So if you look at the success that it actually has on the, on the Kaiso's energy imbalance market, so Smart, we're the first one public utility to join other bank. And now people have seen that it was successful. We, we greatly benefited from it. The rest of the bank members are now following suit. And so now we're engaged in the, you know, Kaiso's enhanced day head market, which is slowly migrating to, a, I'm going to say, an organic RTO. So I think as, as, uh, as Bentley said, um, Ms. Bentley said earlier that, you know, we do have a capacity market. It's just in the form of a bilateral market. And we're taking advantage of the bilateral market and the, the, I'm going to say the EIM market, and now maybe an intense day ahead market. So this this evolution is is really really good for the West. You know, in order for I think each of the LSCs that reliability is top of our mind, and you know we actually have a way to control you know how we want to address reliability. You know, from our old LSC perspective, and not really be something that's mandated. You know, through a capacity market that that a lot of a uh, the contracts that we have or the you know the generations that we have you know will not be you know somehow marginalized or not be optimized so i think i think it's absolutely important you know right now that we, we don't have a mandatory capacity market because i think there's a lot of movement there's a lot of good work as mr holman said about really what the stuff they're doing in the pacific northwest certainly in the northwest power pool you know with smut engages in that because we're connected to to bonneville we're connected to the kaiso market so it gave us a tremendous amount of flexibility that you know in terms of doing what we think is best you know for our customers and i know there's been a lot of talking in california about uh, in terms of the the heat wave and about the, the psps and the rolling blackouts and i just want to highlight that that you know at least for smud you know even during the heat wave last summer not only did we not have a rolling blackouts, we exported about 300 megawatts on each of those days to support, you know, my uh, our neighboring utilities. So I think you just want to make sure that you know you have that create that independence with a look that yes, ultimately you want to get to a market if that's really what's best for the Western all the Western LSEs and independent power producers, right? And it actually meets the I'm going to say the policy objective to get to a clean uh, a zero carbon future. But I think you want to make sure that you don't mandate something and have unintended consequences. So thank you. And thank you, thank you, Commissioner Christie, for that question. I think that's a great question. Thank you very much, Mr. Lau. Commissioner Christie, back to you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the, the the answers and all your commentary today, and, and it's been really excellent. Again, so back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Commissioner Christie. Um, Naveen, uh, I'll uh, turn it back to you if you have any uh, any questions from the staff. We are getting close to. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Chairman Glick. Um, we're getting close to the end of the panel. It's almost four twenty-six p.m. I wanted to check at this point if um, any uh, of the panelists had any closing remarks or, or final thoughts before we conclude the panel, because I think we might not have enough time to go into staff questions given the time limitation. If any of you have any closing remarks or final thoughts um, for the panel, please uh, raise your hand and let me know. Um, Commissioner Gunda, please go ahead. I you know, just uh, wanted to sincerely take this opportunity to thank the, the commission uh, and, and I mean, you and the staff for helping coordinate this and, and inviting me to be a part of this. So just want to extend my gratitude. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lau, please go ahead. Yeah. So, so I too want to, uh, you know, echo Commissioner Gunda's remark about, you know, thanking the 
you know, thanking the commission uh, and thanking really Naveen and setting up this kind of important discussion for us to hear, you know, the different perspectives and, you know, to also to understand, you know, where the commissions are thinking about, you know, how they need to address resource adequacy and, you know, giving us a chance to kind of comment on it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lau. Uh, Mr. Olson, please. All right, I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to kind of present here. I would say kind of the one topic that we haven't necessarily discussed that I do think is important with respect to kind of resource adequacy and coordination as we move forward is a lot of us look at the aspect of climate change and extreme weather events. And it's important to note that when we look at uh, the West, while it is dry, uh, we still have quite a lot of hydro that uh, the West is dependent upon. And as you look at uh, resource adequacy constructs moving into the future, you know, kind of working through that, there should be common definition and coordination, especially as more regions become import regions. Looking at kind of the threats of wildfire as well as drought on kind of the actual impact and uh, ability for that capacity to come through when we get into real-time operations. And so um, the best laid plan is as good as the assumptions that go into it. I think that uh, you know, there's there's likely to be more coordination, not just from a, a discussion regarding resource adequacy, but we really do need to kind of think about some of the risks associated with the key assumptions that go into that as well. So really appreciate the opportunity for comment today, and uh, thank you. Thank you immensely, Mr. Olson. That was very helpful. Ms. Hart, please go ahead. Just like to reiterate the thanks for the opportunity today. Uh, also, a topic that, that didn't necessarily come up, but is one that I hope gets more attention in the future is around resource adequacy metrics. And, and I guess I would just like to briefly um, put in a plug for thinking about resource adequacy metrics that uh, reflect the actual impact of potential shortages on, on human activity, on health, and on safety. Um, there was some discussion of the 1 in 10 standard in the, in the prior panel. Um, but metrics that capture expected unserved energy, duration um, of events, depth of events, um, and really sort of stack that up against uh, the, the amount of the amount of demand out there that might actually be flexible. I think that will be a more holistic way to think about resource adequacy going forward. I don't think it's time to do away with the 1 in 10 standard, but maybe supplement it with additional information that will help both customers and grid operators uh, make rational decisions when we're, when we're in a bind. Thanks. A very good point, Ms. Hart. Thank you very much. Mr. Freeman, please go ahead. Thank you, Naveen, and a special thank you to you. Uh, you've been a great assistance in helping integrate me into this panel today. Uh, I do want to uh, thank the Commission and its staff on behalf of both myself and uh, the National Association of State Utility Consumer Advocates for your outreach to our organization. I would likely not be here today without that. Uh, outreach and I think it's very important for the Commission to have uh, the perspective of consumers so I would encourage the Commission to continue to reach out to Nasuka and we stand uh, ready willing and able to help in any way that we can thank you very much mr. Freeman that's very kind of you um, now we will have mr. Mark Holman please go ahead uh, thank you, Commissioners, for the opportunity to participate today. If I can leave you with uh, one final message is that resource adequacy in the West has really caught all of our attention. What I have witnessed over the last year and a half is the most aggressive push I have seen on a regional initiative in the West to date with senior leadership at a diverse group of utilities rolling up their sleeves and getting a resource adequacy program designed, uh, talking to stakeholders, working on a governance framework. Uh, the comments that we hear back from our CEOs, uh, GMs, and administrators is how impressed they are with both the pace and the thoroughness of the effort. We are not moving slow. We, it has caught all of our attention. We know it's a top priority, and we are moving quickly but prudently uh, in this initiative, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion today. Uh, I imagine it's it's the first of many to happen uh, in the months ahead. Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists and Chairman Glick and the commissioners for taking part today. We've reached 4.32 p.m., so 
it was um, it's the perfect ending time. Uh, despite the volume of great comments we had today, we still managed to keep it timely and trim. So I appreciate everybody's assistance with that. With this, um, today's conference session is coming to an end and we will adjourn for now. We'll reconvene tomorrow, Thursday, June 24th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time and kick off with panel three, which will be focusing on solutions and pathways to addressing shared resource adequacy needs and concluding with panel four, which will be a closing round table discussion to discuss regional coordination with investor interconnection, some of which we've already discussed today, but I'm sure there's much more to explore. Uh, thank you, everybody. Have a good day and please um, remember to come back tomorrow.